The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio. Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Any rebroadcast, reproduction, or other use of this broadcast or podcast without the express written consent of Spaced Out Radio or Spaced Out Radio Limited is strictly prohibited. Listener discretion is advised. You experienced Step right there Top the mountains of British Columbia to you listening around the world. This is Spaced Out Radio with host Dave Scott. They let us play with all our toys, they let us think that we're big boys, they let us make a lot of noise, but we're in the world. They let us think we're superman. You can follow us on our website, spacedoutradio.com, on iTunes, and tune in. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. On Facebook at Spaced Out Radio Show, or on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Are you playing with Bigfoot and aliens again? Uh, Dad, you gotta stop haunting the goat. It's scaring them. All right, seriously, put down the pointy sticks. Look, Dave! Game on! Game on! Game on! <laughs> The password is... All right, all right, all right. Buckle up, space travelers. It's time to go for a ride on Spaced Out Radio. Mr. Bumblefoot, Dave is ready for liftoff. Seriously, Dave? Really? Aren't you a little old for a tinfoil hat? I am. Bye bye. 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 Bye Good evening and welcome to a new week of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. It's good to have you along for the ride on this Monday, June 26th. Tuesday, June 27th, if you're on the East Coast or across the pond, hope you've had a great day, morning, and night as we are live right here in the Great White North on top of the mountains of central British Columbia here 
Seven days a week for your listening entertainment. Let's welcome in everyone listening in on WQEE 99 Rock the Key down in Noonan, Georgia, home of the Walking Dead. We are live as well on the United Public Radio Network on 107.7 FM in New Orleans and over 160 countries around the world. We are live at spacedoutradio.com. On Spreaker, KTLK, The Fringe FM, Renegade Talk Radio out of Las Vegas, The High Plains Talk Radio Network. And if you're listening in on Revolution Radio, remember the Double R Machine is a donation station funded by you, the valued listener. Head on over to freedomslips.com and donate today. If you like our theme music, then rock with us to Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal, formerly of Guns N' Roses, currently of Art of Anarchy. Bumblefoot is the official sound of Spaced Out Radio. If you want to follow us on social media, you can do so on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, you can follow me at Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Tune us in on TuneIn. Download our shows from iTunes. We're also on RadioGuide.fm, Player.fm, TalkStream Live, and Stitcher, and our website is SpacedOutRadio.com. And if you head on over to Patreon.com for as low as a dollar a month, you can become a patron of SOR as well. Now, if you want to take part in this show, you got to do me a favor. you got to sign into one of the chat rooms. you got to go on our website, click on Listen Live. You could go on Revolution Radio, Spreaker, the UPRN chat room, or maybe join the Facebook group, the SOR Space Travelers Club. Or if you're on Twitter, just go to the hashtag Spaced Out Radio. I will get to your questions in there as well. Now, if you head to our website for 5 bucks a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. And if you go right now to our Spaced Out Radio store, you can pick up yourself up a t-shirt, a poster, a sticker, or... If you're looking for a weekend getaway, how about Spaced Out Radio's first annual Caribou Paracon? September 29th to October 1st, right here in beautiful 108 Mile Ranch, British Columbia, at the Spruce Hills Spa and Resort. We would love to have you with us. A full weekend of paranormal entertainment. Get your tickets on our website for 10% off until July 31st. Now, if you head to our website for 5 bucks a month, Once again, become an SOR Space Traveler. You can also join the encounter online. Enjoy your reading time with everything paranormal, courtesy of our editors, Eric Markham and Everett Themer. You can also check out my latest blog there as well. Had some fun with it this week. I did a bunch of top fives in my life. And if you've had an experience you can't explain, fill out an SOR Sightlines report. One of the top investigative researchers when it comes to the topic of the paranormal is UFO cops Butch Witkowski. A controversial figure to some, Butch is someone who people absolutely love or they love to complain about. The funny part about it is, he doesn't care. And why should he? Because he has more pressing things to take care of, like what the hell is going on out in this world? That may sound like a little bit of a joke, but it's complete truth. The field of the paranormal is one that causes many chases, false flags, and sci-fi stories. But read between the lines, and there is some truth in some of these tall tales. In fact, finding the truth is what keeps Butch going on a daily basis. Whether it's alien abductions, cattle mutilations, ghosts running in rounded barns, bipedal canines, Bigfoot, or in tonight's case, Mothman, Butch is one of those people who gets the first call to come in and see what's going on. His no-nonsense approach to his client and the topic at hand allows everyone involved to know there's a professional investigation going on. Butch is here the last Monday of every month on SOR with his feature, Strange Days. Our good friend of this show, Butch Witkowski from UF4Cop.com. Butch, always a pleasure to have you on the air. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing fine, and always a pleasure to be here. Absolutely, absolutely. What have you been up to lately besides chasing around all these weird creatures? Uh, chasing a lot, a lot of, a lot of weird creatures. <laughs> uh, right now, it's uh, well. We're getting ready to do uh, a couple more expeditions on our bipedal stuff up in central Pennsylvania, and then you know, last month started all this um, flying bat, humanoid, whatever, over in Chicago. And um, we've been following that pretty close, and uh, along with Alon Strickler and his crew and uh, Manuel Navarrete and all the investigators up there in Chicago, uh, it's getting to be pretty weird. Is it ever a boring day with you? 
Let's be honest. Do you ever have a boring day? Uh, no, I don't. Unfortunately, I, I would really like one, but I it, even when I think it's going to get boring and I'm just ready to like take a shower and hit the sack or something, the phone will ring and then it starts all over again. I hear you there. I hear you there, my friend. And and you know what? It's one of those things where every day it's a new adventure, and I'm sure it's a lot like what we do here. You know, the difference is you don't turn it off after one show. I have to, and then focus on the next one. But when you are building cases, how many files do you actually have over the years you've been doing this? I don't think oh I've God. ever asked you that. Oh, my God. Uh, let's see. Um uh, right where I'm sitting here in my office, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, six, four cabinet, uh, four drawer cabinets, and then I have one, two, three, four, uh, pretty good sized plastic um, storage containers with the old cases in, plus whatever's in the computers, and there's five of those sitting here. Yeah, it's a little extensive. Now, Butch, one of the things that that I always love, and I and for some reason I just realized tonight after I typed my intro, you have this polarizing reputation where people absolutely love the work you do, and then there's people who are polar opposite on the other side of the spectrum. I realize mm-hmm. in, in this field you can never please everybody because everybody's opinion differs. Everybody has uh, a way that they feel they need to investigate or investigation should be done. Why do you think over the years that you have become such a polarizing figure? And did you expect it to be that way? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I saw that early on before I even really got involved uh, with other groups and other investigators, um, it's um, it's the nature of the beast when it comes to Fortean research. I mean, uh, there are folks that um, they just believe, and maybe rightfully or maybe just lunacy, that they are the best at what they do, and there is nobody better. And if anybody steps in their way, then they're automatically the enemy and they'll do whatever they have to do to, uh, you know, get you out of the picture. Unfortunately, all these people, and there's not that many, but there's enough that, you know, I don't bump into them out in the woods. I don't see them out on research. I'm not seeing them at star show, uh, star watches. I don't bump into them in haunted houses. You know, I don't see these people out anywhere. Um, uh, they They may have fancy websites or they may have, uh, you know, a blog of some sort, uh, but uh, pretty much in my world, with the people I deal with, they're irrelevant, um, and they will continue to be that way. Um, there's two things that they don't do that every investigator out there should always do, and that is they need to demand evidence, and they need to think critically, and they do not do that. So uh, there's the biggest um difference between them and I and the people I deal with and uh, even the people I deal with they they've been gone after uh, belittled ridiculed and some of these people have been in the business uh, 30 35 years and you know they know what they're doing they know how to conduct an investigation they have the connections and um, uh, you know I, I never let it bother me it still doesn't bother me it doesn't bother them so they can do what they like, say what they want. It doesn't make any difference to me. Like I said, I don't see them next to me when I'm walking through the woods. I don't see them next to me uh, anywhere. I mean, they're just non-existent. They talk up a good game. Uh, they like the conference circuit uh, because they can get out there and, um, you know, put themselves up as some kind of important researcher. But when you dig down, they don't really do anything. Uh, and, you know... They can do it their way. We'll keep doing it our way. Well, one of the things that I like about you, and the reason why we bring you on in this show, is because of that no-nonsense approach that you tend to take with your investigations. How did you learn that technique? What makes your investigation so much different than what other people are doing right now? Well, the difference is you have uh, folks that will... You know, something strange will happen, and I don't care what it is. It could be paranormal, it could be crypto, it could be UFO. 
something strange will happen, and um, the investigator or investigative team or group will will either do the easiest thing possible, which is they'll make a phone call if they can, or they will send an email. Uh, they'll never go on site. Uh, they'll never do any background research to see if anything like that ever occurred in the area. Uh, the biggest thing in this, in all of this, is the background research. Uh, just like the Chicago Phantom thing that's going on right now, uh, where they got now 20 reports, I believe. But uh, due to diligent researchers, they found five reports in the past, in 94, in 2010, 2011, uh, reports of the same thing that they're seeing now but uh you know you have um a group that stepped out right away because they got the first report and they stepped out and said it's a guy in a flying suit well it took about 30 seconds to disband that whole theory but they're sticking by it now um i don't know how somebody in a flying suit would uh be making slow turns over the water and coming to a standstill or anything like that. A flying suit, the minimal the minimal speed in a flying suit, which is always taken off of a mountain, I mean, they always try to get the highest point possible, is 100 mile per hour. And uh, this creature is actually flying in airspace between the Midway Airport and the O'Hare Airport, which is an absolute no-no. Um... Another thing is, if anybody's ever been to the windy city of Chicago, in a snowstorm, if you're inside of a building, the snow is blowing up. It's not coming down because of the updrafts of all the tall buildings. And the one investigator works in those buildings, and he said, if somebody jumped off of this building, which is one of the taller uh, skyscrapers in Chicago, he said they would fall maybe six or eight feet, and they'd be picked straight up in the air and slammed straight into the next building right across the street. He said that'd be the end of them in a matter of minutes. There is no way it's a guy in a suit. It's not a drone. There's no noise. Um, Nobody manufactures a drone like that. The drone would be picked up on airport radar because it sits between two of the biggest international airports in this country. And uh, it's always over the water, uh, Lake Michigan. And um, there's the difference. Uh, you've got researchers out there right now that are scanning, photo, you know, setting up camera traps, uh, doing background research, and this is what most groups don't do. They do not do background research. They just run with it, and the group that went out to investigate it within a matter of hours said it was a man in a suit. It's not true. They don't know that. So it's a whole lot easier to put forth some cockamamie theory that you have but then again if you don't have the evidence and all you got is your thoughts on what you think it may be uh don't mean anything you know one of the things i and let's go back in history here my friend if you don't mind back to the back to the 60s when mothman started hanging around in uh, point pleasant west virginia Take mm-hmm. us th- take us through the history of that. Well, the the it was actually seen by teenagers that were out by an old um, armory. What that armory? It was an old ammo uh, manufacturing plant uh, outside of uh, uh, West Virginia, there at Point Pleasant, and it was abandoned. Uh, so the buildings are still there, and um, it was some teenagers and either going for a ride or going to party. Who knows? And they saw this, what they described as a um, moth-looking-like man-thing with glowing red eyes. And um, it kind of hovered around and looked like it was coming for them. They took off, then they went back to town. They thought it, they said it followed them. Uh, then uh, it was seen uh, by a couple of workers that were working in that area uh, a little while later. Um uh, that saw it up in one of the old um, buildings from that manufacturing plant, and they seen it go from one floor to another floor to a top floor and then kind of just disappear. The, um, then, of course, you have the silver bridge falling in, which they say was caused by the Mothman, uh, but it actually was a, a set of cable bolts that held the cables for the suspension part of the bridge 
and uh, they were just worn through, and they cracked, and down went the bridge. Unfortunately, had I believe it was 47 or 48 people killed, and a, a number were injured. But uh, a picture was put out uh, not long uh, before the bridge crashed of something up on top of the bridge. Now, all you see is this little black dot line on top of the bridge, which automatically became the Mothman, who automatically became the harbinger of bad things to happen. Uh, Mothman was seen around, uh, some, sim, a similar creature was seen around Fukushima, has been seen around earthquakes, um, tsunamis. I mean, I mean, you know, it's just, it just carried on, on, on. But the thing is, all these people that have been looking for this thing, nobody has a picture of this thing. Um, the drawings, um, they don't have any any proof of anything. Um, they didn't have uh, a clear shot of this thing on the bridge. Could have been a bird. Could have been an eagle. Could have been anything. It could have been a large bird. Um, the uh, I believe there was one story also where it was seen on top of a building in town. Uh, no picture there. Um, it, it's it's almost like. You know, Roswell, um, lots of information, no proof. Um, the thing is that when these folks get involved in, uh, you know, they, they, it starts out as something, uh, a, a sighting of some sort, uh, just like Dogman or Bigfoot or any of them. There was a, a sighting. Uh, Bigfoot is an an anomaly because there is the Cat Patterson Gimlin film, which has not and cannot and will not be debunked. So whatever Patty was, Patty was. Um, Now, all these years of looking for UFOs, lots of pictures of stuff in the sky. Most of it's ours. Some of it's not. Uh, Do we know what it is? No, we have no idea. Um, Bigfoot, every picture of Bigfoot is, you know, all I can imagine is some researchers out there in the woods or coming out of their tent and going like, wow, there's Bigfoot. Get in the tent and get the worst camera we got because the camera shots are always blurry. Um, now, could, um, like some people say, could the creature cause that blurriness in a photograph? Sure it could. Um, uh, keeping an open mind at all this stuff and looking at every possible thing, no matter how ludicrous it sounds, uh, is the way to do it. There's no other way to get around it. Um, you know, when people talk interdimensional, well, first of all, there's no such thing as interdimension. That was a that was a uh, phrase that was uh, actually put out on on uh, Star Trek when it was on TV. Um, uh, teleport teleport communica- uh, communications and stuff like that. Uh, again, uh, a lot of that stuff came from sci-fi. But could it be? Sure, it could. You know, you got to prove it. But if you keep an open mind, all that stuff is possible. I guess. Um, you know, our, our bipedal canines, uh, I probably, after the first two reports, um, I probably would have brushed them off as, you know, misidentification. But uh, as the reports came in, and, and they were from all over central Pennsylvania, different times, different people, different situations, uh, everybody describing the same thing. And then I find a newspaper print back in, you know, uh, a newspaper in Erie, Pennsylvania, in the 18, mid-1800s that describes the same creature that's being seen in, in 2014, 15, 16, and 17. So uh, we kind of stuck with that. And um, then you have, uh, you know, parallel universes, interdimensional travel. I mean, some researchers, I mean, scientists, not researchers, but some scientists say it's possible. Um, you know, this messing around with the Harden uh, Collider um, God knows what that's going to do if it ever goes sour. So, I mean, everybody's looking for an answer, and the, you have uh, a lot of strange things that an investigator can't answer. Like, how do you how do, how do you follow a set of footprints in the snow of anything? I don't care what it is, and then they disappear. They stop. They're not there anymore. I mean, you're following a track, and the track disappears. So, where the footprints go? I mean. Everything else is here. You just follow them for 50, 75, 100 feet, and now they're gone. And um, you have, 
there are so many uh, things about uh, the research and the type of equipment used. All these things have one thing on their side, and that is stealth. I mean, it's just the way it is. And the only thing we have on our side is definitely not stealth. So the only thing we have is technology to use uh, to whatever we can we whatever we can get. And um, it's 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 strange, you know. You can spend hours and hours and hours researching something and come up with nothing, and then weeks or months later, you come across something that you weren't even looking for that gives you the answer to that first question that you couldn't find. So it gets tedious, and um, I find that the the good researchers uh, that are out there, and there are a lot of them, and there are a lot of guys that are just beginning that are learning that are getting really good, and um, kudos to them, uh, because guys like me ain't going to be around forever. Um, And... um, there are uh, a lot of things going on that um, are very hard to explain. I just saw the other day, uh, yesterday I guess it was, that NASA was going to uh, break the news that aliens are real. Well, it took like four hours before that was debunked. And um, it's just, it's, it's interesting, it's hard work, and uh, there's a lot of stuff to do uh, before you even say anything or start to um uh, you know uh look at uh, the different types of individuals that are involved in this i mean you have um scholars you have scientists i mean you have you know just researchers like myself um it's it's a whole different ball game out there than it was all those years back uh it's different now with the internet and with the interconnections of you know, you can call a researcher in England now uh, uh, over the Internet, uh, no big deal. You can, instead of going around visiting people, you can have a, a Skype conference. Uh, you can do a whole lot of things now that weren't able to do back then, which does make it easier in following a trail of information. But again, you know, unless you come to the end of that um, uh, trail of information, you have uh, still beaten a dead horse. Everybody wants proof, and you can't mm-hmm. blame and you can't blame people, Butch, uh, because they've heard the stories, they've mm-hmm. seen the technology, they've heard the excuses, they've seen the CGI, they've seen the BS pulled over their eyes so many times that they're fed up. They want proof. Yeah. And, and you're one of those guys who is out there going for proof. Now, I'm not talking footprint or a hair sample or a piece of poop sitting on the ground or anything like that because it always comes back from an unknown animal species because they don't want to ever take the chance and actually name something, even though that's the scientific thing to do. How close are we, whether it's UFOs, whether it's werewolves, whether it's Mothman, how close are we to actually getting some... 100% proof that these creatures exist, even though we don't have a body? Uh, the only way at this point that we're going to prove anything, and, and we'll just use a bipedal as an example, is to get him on a, uh, a FLIR camera. Nothing hides from FLIR. So uh, video or still pictures... Um, that's why we've made our biggest investment in these type of cameras where we can set them up and we don't have to stand there and stare at the woods like a bunch of morons. We can let the cameras do the watching for us and we can sit back at, at a table under a tent or in a tent or in the truck or whatever and just watch the monitors and the whole time it's recording, it's saving the recording. So if I see something, uh, we, we always put out markers. When I say markers, we put markers as to height. So if we're watching a tree line, we'll go up and we'll measure off Uh, 12-foot increment, and it'll either be a plastic band or something around the tree. That'll be a 12-foot marker for us. So if the camera, um, and then we'll we'll also do the 6-foot thing, but if if I got something that's standing there and it's closer to that 12-foot marker, that's not anything that should be in those woods. And especially on FLIR, it's going to give the outline and the body temperature and everything else of whatever's standing there. Uh, That would be good proof. That would be excellent proof, as a matter of fact. A still picture, 
well, the first thing that come out of everybody's mouth is, well, you photoshopped it or it was digitized or you manipulated the negative. It was a 35 millimeter or whatever. So the best thing that we're looking at right now is uh, we have sound devices in the ground to measure uh, movement on the ground. And there is uh, also one of the th- is the use of the FLIR. And, um, and, you know, we carry all kind of cameras. We carry digital. We carry, we carry film cameras. We carry infrared and FLIR. And so if all those match what we have, there's something there. Now, what is it? I don't, I don't know what it is, but there's something there that these people saw, and we can prove it with, with uh, one of the camera devices or the sound traps or the, uh, uh, the uh, devices that measure something walking through the woods. And these are pretty sensitive. I mean, uh, it actually, and I don't know how it works, so don't ask me that, um, but the military uses them. So um, something can walk across these uh, embedded things in the ground, uh, embedded sensors, and these sensors will send back uh, a signal to a computer, laptop in our case, and it will tell us pretty much what it is. And it doesn't have to see it. It just has to know the weight. So if something scurries across these two things and it comes up to be between five and six pounds, it's possible it's a rabbit, uh, maybe 10 pounds, 11, 12 pounds, could be a coyote, I get something that weighs three or four hundred pounds. Could be a bear, absolutely, or bigger. But then if I have, let's just say I get the three or four hundred pound footsteps on the sensors, and at the same time the FLIR records something that's standing there over 12 foot or just under 12 foot. That's not something that should be in our woods. That's not something that should be on this planet. So that's what I would consider good evidence. A lot of people take evidence and they take what is natural and make it the supernatural. I know uh, Mike Smith, whom you talk to from my team, and you, he passes photographs for your opinion. Him and I were out a week and a half ago, and we came across this track that looked it looked like a, an 11, 12-foot print. You can mm-hmm. see the toes in it, but we were on an incline, and and Mike pointed out, point blank you know what that bear's foot slipped and you could see one claw mark in it how often are we getting evidence that is an actual how can i put this a natural occurrence from an animal or a species we know compared to something supernatural a lot Uh, there's a lot of that um uh, 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 one of our central pennsylvania cases the guy uh sent me photographs he said that he had scratches on a tree and when he sent the photograph, it did look like claw scratches on a tree, uh, high up, real high up. And when we got there uh, on the scene and looked, it was actually a natural formation of the tree bark. But it did look like three scratches. So if you would be an unscrupulous researcher, you could have put that picture out and said, yeah, we looked at it and there's three scratches in a tree. But those three scratches were actually natural bark. And then there were some tracks close by. Uh, now, they were in mud, so, of course, the minute something steps in mud, the, the track gets bigger, wider, because of, you know, you're pushing wet ground out from underneath a solid object. And um, we just kept following them until they actually got out onto some dry ground. It was a black bear. And um, probably a two-year-old from the size. But, um, you know, we have... We even have a library in the truck because, you know, sometimes you think you're smart, but you're not really the sharpest knife in the drawer when it comes to things that are out in the woods that you don't know anything about. So, I mean, we have uh, 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 books, we have photographs, we have prints, uh, pictures of prints from all over the country. So if somebody calls me out and I'm looking at a print and I look through the through one of our photo albums of prints and the print is identical to the Patty photograph, or a patty print taken out there in California, then it's a hoax. You know, somebody bought a print offline, which you can do. You can buy them on eBay. And, um, you know, people often say, well, do you believe in Bigfoot? Look, people see are seeing something. They've been seeing it way back before people were even here. I mean, 
there are stories that go back and back and back for centuries of you know big hairy men um men of the forest uh, uh, all kind of names and and uh the descriptions back then are descriptions from recent same thing with these bipedals you know when we started researching them they go way back and um the descriptions are identical now i'm sure the first person that ran into one of our the first bipedal and the second bipedal report that we got that were almost identical in size shape everything else surely didn't go back and research a newspaper article in 1860 something to get that description the description was a small article it was just something that a farmer reported saying to the newspaper and the local constabulary and that was it now that article can't be but a hundred words and I'm sure nobody found that I found it by accident but look people are seeing something you know you can't go out there and say everybody's lying uh, uh, people put out um, gifts for Bigfoot and it could be a toy it could be a piece of fruit it could be a shiny object it could be anything and they put it out and they'll come back and maybe those are gone and there's a handful of acorns there and we're not talking about something laying along a trail these people hide this stuff in the woods where they're following track or they've had a report now yeah I guess it could be hoaxed but you can't call everything a hoax and you can't call everybody a liar I mean you know you got to have some faith <laughs> or you wouldn't be doing it to begin with and you know or when you get a report uh, and this has happened a number of times with these bipedals where um, you, you know you're talking to a full-grown man uh, a guy he, he knows slouch I mean he's a big guy you know they rip you apart if he really got pissed off at you and he's shaking like a leaf he's got tears in his eyes as he's trying to explain what he saw he's scared to death he, while he's talking to you he's like looking around like the thing standing behind him I mean that guy's not lying he's telling you the truth and then the friend that's with him, when you start questioning him away from the other guy, you get the same response. So whatever these guys saw and whatever they described is out there. And again, I want to make myself perfectly clear, this is not Dogman. Dogman is always seen on all fours. He will stand up, but he drops right back down again. He's seen with long, floppy ears. He's seen with dog-like faces. He has a long, floppy tail. Sometimes he has a long, straight tail. Um, they're not large at any means. When they stand up, they might be four or five feet tall. Uh, scruffy fur, uh, f- fur, uh, fur uh, with uh, uh, multicolored, some of them are multicolored. That is in no way, shape, or form anything like the reports of the bipedals that we get where they're, you know, eight foot tall and bigger, large wolf head, pointed ears, dark, short fur, black or brown uh, no tail uh, massive chest thin waist arms muscular uh, hands with claws muscular thighs thin waisted hock legs like a dog and they stand they don't drop on all fours and the one was actually seen going across uh, you know crossed a, a two-lane highway in two bounds that's two steps that's not a dog and I think what they are reporting in certain areas with these dogs, they could be feral dogs that are just running loose. But this dog guy, mm, nah, I'm not buying it. And uh, I just saw where Richard asked about Bigfoot attacks. Yeah, there are reports of Bigfoot attacks. And some of them are in the uh, 1800s, uh, late 1800s, and mostly by miners or gold guys or guys who were out trapping. There are reports. There's reports of deaths. And... Um, they are uh, um, some are factual some you can actually find the police report on or whoever they reported to local sheriff or whatever <clears throat> then there's some that are not where you have somebody says they shot a Bigfoot and they buried it and then they go back and they said oh well it's not here anymore the government probably came and got it well if you shot something and you buried it how'd the government know where it was That'd be my first question We've had no reports of any uh, uh, injuries, 
uh, caused by a bipedal. Everybody that sees them, even people that have a, had guns in their hands, have had the same feeling or the same thought go through their head, don't shoot, just leave. Now, was that given to them uh, telepathically? Or did all these people have that same thought just by looking at it? I find that hard to believe. So is can this thing communicate? Uh, how long has it been here? Um, I'm, my best estimation is this thing's a relic. It's been around a long time. It's not something that just popped up yesterday. Because when we started looking, we found a lot of pretty much blown off uh, research um, uh, investigations. And they go back from the 1800s, 19, early 1900s, mid-1900s, 1940s, uh, 60s, 50s, 70s, 90s, of um, one lady chased uh, uh, by one of these things. Um, so there's just too much out there to pass it off as something that doesn't exist. Whatever it is, it exists. We just got to prove it exists, and and we're going to do our best to do that. I mean, you know, it's all we can do. I'm a firm believer, and I know I'm in the minority here, but I'm curious <laughs> to get your opinion. I don't think it's possible to kill Sasquatch or a Dogman. Probably not. I, I agree. Re- I really don't. We have heard too many stories of these creatures being shot with high-caliber weapons and literally no bodies, no trace, no blood trails, nothing. Yeah. Right. Why do you think that these creatures cannot be taken down? And uh, the one dogman story, let me let me refresh this for a second. But the one dogman story that I heard out of Louisiana was taken where a guy put eight or nine bullets into this thing and this thing kept coming at him and coming at him like it wasn't even affected. Like it was like, that's all you got? Give me some more. Mm-hmm. That would be uh, Rougarou, right? Something like that, yeah. Well, look, there have been even Bigfoot stories where, uh, in Pennsylvania, here in Pennsylvania, where um, Bigfoot have been, like, roaming around in some, around somebody's farm or in your backyard, and somebody comes out with a high-powered rifle and, you know puts three or four rounds in him and all he does is like grunt or make a squeal and then walks away um i don't know how many of your listeners are hunters but you don't want to get hit with a 30 out six you're not going to walk away and you're not going to make much of a grunt either you're just going to bite the dust and then there are uh, uh reports where uh you have uh, uh one guy that actually shot one with an arrow and uh, he heard it scream, it turned, it ran, it ran, it ran into the dark uh, part of the woods, and he walked over, and the arrow was laying on the ground. There was no, the arrow wasn't damaged, the feathers weren't even out of whack, there was no blood on it, it was just laying there. And, you know, he picked the arrow up, and I guess he took it somewhere to have it tested for DNA or something, I don't even remember the whole story, but they found nothing. And that's another thing, you know, uh, the stuff people find that they say is connected to Bigfoot. Um, there was a researcher not too long ago, picked up a twig while he was with a group, picked up a twig off the ground. That would be like you going out in your backyard right now and picking up a twig and turning around and looking at me and going like, this is a Bigfoot toothbrush. And that's what he told them. Now, what's wrong with that guy? There's a lot of weirdos out there. A lot of weirdos, man. Yeah, how would he know it's a toothbrush? And if he knows that much, okay, tell me what kind of toothpaste he uses. Is he using Crest, Colgate, what? What's he doing? Who's his dentist? He seemed more like an Aquafresh kind of guy. Yeah, but and and, and then you get the ones where when they see, when they report a Bigfoot and they go, whatever they do, they do. And next thing you know, well, I actually saw a Bigfoot and I saw his wife and his kid. How do you know it's his wife and kid? How do you know? What are you talking about? And now, of course, you got lapsaritis out there who communicates with them all the time. But, um, look, I don't want to communicate with anything. I don't want to hurt anything. I'm not going to kill anything. All I want to do is prove it exists. And I want it in, on FLIR. I want it on infrared. I want it on digital. I want it on 35 millimeter all at the same time. You know, and that's it. That's what I want. And put it out and say, here's what it is. Don't ask me what it is because I don't know, but it's big, it's ugly, it's mean. 
uh, I don't want to mess with it, so I did my part of the job. So if anybody else wants to go out and chase it around, have at it. I'm going for it, Butch. Mike and I, <laughs> Mike, Mike and I are going for, for it. The problem, the problem that we are having around here is for the first time in 30 years in our community, there's grizzly bears within miles of the town. Oh, you don't want to mess with those guys. No, no, they're, they're, they're pissed off, okay? You know, they are just pissed off. And, and well, Mike just found a, a grizzly bear print the other yeah. day. I think it yep. was 11, 12 inches by 9 inches. He sh- uh, he, he uh, 14, sh- he, it four- was 14, 14 by 9. Yeah, 14 by 9. and he showed, That was a rear pad. Yeah, and he showed a conservation officer that picture, and literally the conservation officer said, well, there's a trophy bear in the area. Right? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, 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 a that's big... what we're talking about. That's, a, that's a th- almost a 1,000-pound bear. Well, now, just to show you how, uh, and I don't know why this is, but bears are really acting strange in the last year and a half. Just a week ago, uh, now, I live in the country, okay? Uh, I'm surrounded by Amish and Mennonite farms, farmers. That's what's here. And um, the uh, uh, down in Leola, Pennsylvania, which from my house to theirs maybe 20 mile, uh, a lady called in and said there was a bear in the yard. And uh, they went down, uh, the conservation officers and rangers, they went down and tried to get him out of the tree. They couldn't. They shot him a couple times. The third, t- third time they shot him, with, you know, uh, again, when they're shooting him, they're shooting him with a pen, you know, like put him to sleep type thing. The third shot, he fell asleep, but then they had to poke him out of the tree. He weighed 550 pounds. That's a black bear. That's a lot of black bear, 550 pounds. Average bear shot in Pennsylvania during bear season 250 to 300 pounds. This guy was huge. So they loaded him up in the trailer and, you know, took him away and let him loose out in the forest somewhere in central Pennsylvania. But when you're talking about a grizzly, a grizzly makes that 550-pound black bear look like a, a kitten the side of a Great Dane. They're huge. And and they have no sense of humor. No, black no. Bears don't have- you mess with a black bear. Well, we've had some. We've had deaths here with black bear, and there have been oh, out in the west coast. Out in the west too, they've also had recent. Uh, they just had a a young uh, runner that was on a run with a, a a school group, got off the beaten path, and he was um, mauled to death. And then right before that, there was a lady. I guess uh, she was some kind of photographer. She got mauled to death. So I mean, there's things out there that'll kill you. And you know, it's like I always tell people when they enter the water, you're entering the food chain. Well, I now added to that, when you enter the forest, you enter the food chain. And uh, to be very careful, um, like I, and I've said this before, we don't carry firearms. We carry non-lethal weapons that are made for getting animals out of your way. And they will hurt and they will cause damage as far as uh, uh, the type of gas that we use, which is uh, ghost gas. And it will stick to the fur. And the uh, rubber riot rounds are 68 caliber. They will hurt. They're traveling at about 400 foot per second, and you don't want to get hit by one of those either. So, uh, but um, it's especially up in your area. I mean, well, in our area too, you also have to battle the <laughs> the, the three to four hundred pound cougars. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean oh, yeah. the the mountain lion population. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I was sitting on my lawn chair last week, and I saw my dog get up. It was Tuesday last week. I see my dog get up from the ground, and he starts walking up the driveway. So I get up, I look, and there's a conservation officer. He's like, hey, how you doing? And I'm like, good. He goes, you got any small kids? And I said, yeah. He goes, well, just so you know, there was a cougar spotted in your backyard, and it walked up towards the school, and we're looking for him. Oh, man. Right? So here's the funny part. I'm going to tell you this story because I'm not sure if I believe it, okay? Butch, and I'm curious because you're pretty open-minded with things, and I'm I'm going to get your opinion on this. And you can tell me if I'm crazy or not. I'm okay with that. Okay? Everybody, if if you follow First Nations or whatever... Everybody will tell you that every human on on the planet has a totem animal or a spirit animal that follows them. Correct? That's correct. And mine happens to be a cougar. Okay. And when I get that spirit animal 
coming close to me, his face will be within an inch of mine if I'm meditating. And he is beautiful. All right. Mm -hmm. So here's my thing. And I don't know why I think this because, you know, as Elizabeth Anglin kind of let out of the bag on Saturday, I'm, I'm kind of intuitive at times. I never okay. try. I never trust my abilities, but I'm kind of intuitive. And anyhow, long story short, the one thing Elizabeth I've learned from Elizabeth is that animals are very intuitive and telepathic. So in my brain, I start sending messages to this cougar, saying, "Get the hell out of Dodge, man! If you stick around here, you're dead." The, the conservation officers are coming to get you, and they will kill you. You can't be near the school. So I'm sending this all out, and I'm, I don't know why. I just felt like I needed to do it. They, they brought in the cougar tracking dog and couldn't find him later that day. He was gone. Do you think there's any? Do you think there's anything to that, or do you think it's just absolute 100% sheer coincidence like I think it is? Uh, no, I, I do think there's something to that, and I'm going to relate a story to you now. Um, this is, this comes from a tracker and he's a professional tracker. That's what he does for a living. He's been doing it for the last 35 years and his spirit, and he is part, uh, Indian, but indigenous, his, his spirit animal is a wolf. And he was tracking a bear that had done some damage in a campground and he was getting pretty nasty and he's tracking this bear to kill it uh, because I, I guess it did kill a dog or two or whatever, and it did go after a child. And they went after this uh, thing, and um, he got himself boxed in sort of a um, kind of a half-assed canyon situation where there was only one way in and one way out, and as he gets in, turns around, well, lo and behold, guess who's blocking the only entrance? And... Um, he, he said, he said, the only thing that came to my mind is I, I just wish my spirit animal would bring someone of his buddies and help me out with this one because this isn't going to be good. And as he started to raise the rifle into his view came four wolves at the bear, distracted the bear, ran the bear off. The bear ran down the trail. He don't know what happened to the wolves. He only saw them for that couple split second go after the bear. And then he heard two shots, which were from his, his partners down the line, and they killed the bear. And then when he went down, they, he asked them if they had seen the wolves, and they said, what wolf? What are you talking about? There's no wolves. The bear just come run out of the canyon. We shot him. You all right? And he's there. Yeah, I guess. But now there's a perfect example of what you just said. This guy's just wishing for his spirit animal to come help him out. And his spirit animal not only shows up, but he brings a few buddies with him. And they run him out of a situation where it was going to be, you know, Anything could have happened. The rifle could have jammed. Uh, you know, a black bear can cover 50 yards in a matter of seconds. You know, they're fast. So well, grizzly can too. But, um, no, I believe that. Yeah, you probably warned him, and, you know, he took off. Well, I'm hoping that's the case. Like I said. Yeah. Like I, mean, I you said, can't, uh, you can't yeah, prove yeah. it. You can't prove oh, it. Yeah. There's no way to prove it. I mean, it's... it's, it's uh, and it's not uh, wishful thinking. I mean, like this guy, you know, he wanted help. He didn't know what to do, and he, all he could do was call on his spirit animal. And the spirit animal showed up with a few buddies and got him out of a jam. And so he's a true believer, and, you know, I know the guy. I mean, I believe what he said. And um, they did show, he did show me some pictures of the bear. But, um Look, there's there's so many things going on right now. I mean, you know, there's people out there trying to make the connection between uh, aliens and Bigfoot. Uh, we've had those reports here in Pennsylvania where uh, people have said that they've actually seen Bigfoot piloting a craft. Mm, that's kind of a stretch for me. Um, but um, they've seen Bigfoot get into and come out of crafts of some sort. Uh, they've had crafts land in their yard where Bigfoot came out, walked around, got back in, and off it went. But there's no evidence of a landing at any of these locations, which there, I'm sure there would be. And there is no photographs. There's no, you know, just a one-person report or maybe a, a, a young couple report, you know, teenagers. And um, it ain't like everybody go out there 
and you can put on a lie detector or, you know, <laughs> under sodium pentothal or whatever and get the information. You just got to take what people tell you and, and just, you know, document it, put it in the back of your head, put it in your PDA, put it in your laptop, and, you know, when you're going out, you look at this stuff before you go out and try to keep it all in there and hope for the best, and that's all you can really do. We got about 35, 40 seconds before we got to go to our first break tonight. The stories, Butch, just keep piling up. At what point, though, do people give up on the truth? I don't think they'll ever give up. I think, well, you'll have some people that will that just, you know, blow it off and say, wow, this is all nonsense, they get done with it. And then there's people that, you know, even though they say they're not going to get involved, they don't want to hear any more about it, they still are. They're still looking, they're still asking questions, they're still sending us an email every now and then. Uh, you know, even when you explain to them what they might have seen, whether it be uh, an asteroid or, or a, uh, a bolide or a meteor, um, and they you don't hear from them for a year or two, and then they get back and they're like, you know what, mm-hmm. I just... Yeah, and on that note, Butch, I'm going to get you to hold on. We'll finish that answer right after this. Butch Wachowski's Strange Days heard the final Monday of every month on Space Out Radio. Make sure you check out his website, ufocop.com. Two hours to go with Big Bad Butch right after this. Coming September 29th to October 1st, the first annual Spaced Out Radio Caribou Paracon. Hi, this is Dave Scott. The event will be held at the Spruce Hill Spawn Resort in 108 Mile Ranch, British Columbia. Come join us for an amazing weekend of speakers talking all things paranormal, UFOs, ghosts, aliens, Sasquatch, intuitiveness. Listen to great speakers like Miriam Delicato, Samantha Mowat, and the crypto guru Ronald Murphy. Get your VIP passes by going to spacedoutradio.com and clicking on the Paracon banner. Come to BC, where the paranormal is waiting for you. From coast to coast to coast, Blacklight Uncharted is taking on the paranormal across Canada. From ghostly hauntings to the UFOs flying above in conjunction with MUFON Canada, they're closely investigating what's going on in the northern skies and checking out the apparitions that walk among us. Check out our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. We want to know your thoughts, we want to hear your experiences, and we want you to share your stories. The answers are out there, and we intend to find them. Would you like to become one of our space travelers? All you have to do is click on the space travelers icon at spacedoutradio.com. For only $5 a month, you can get access to some great prizes, as well as private monthly shows, newsletters, and a members-only section on our website. Become a space traveler today. It's paranormal news at its finest. Welcome to The Encounter. At spaceoutradio.com, The Encounter Online is SOR's trusted news source for everything weird and strange going on around the world. This is news editor Eric Markham. Our team of journalists are scouring the planet for those strange stories that rarely make the mainstream. No fear-mongering or fake news here. Head over to spaceoutradio.com and encounter The Encounter. Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy in your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? Have you had an experience you can't explain? Had a run-in with ghosts, maybe Bigfoot, or seen lights in the sky? Hi, I'm Mike Schmidt from the SOR Sight Lines. I'm here to investigate your sighting. Head to spacedoutradio.com and fill out a report on the sight lines. All your information is 100% confidential, and I will help you figure out what you've been seeing. File your report, and let's find out the answers together. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. 
for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There, you will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us, from radio commercials to banners and social media. Have a product you like our hosts to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. Have you got your Cosmic Passport? If you need one, tune in to Cosmic Passport on Spaced Out Weekend. This is Elizabeth Anglin, ET experiencer, spirit medium, and host of Cosmic Passport. Each weekend, I'll be bringing you interviews and support from other paranormal experiencers and the best in intuitive spiritual guidance from across the globe. It's all happening starting at 9 p.m. Pacific Time, midnight Eastern, on spacedoutradio.com. From British Columbia to Northern California, Pacific North Weird has Cascadia covered. Check out our feature videos at spacedoutradio.com, where I, Vincent Zunza, and my super sleuth partner, Alexandra Sullivan, track down the weird and strange stories from around the Pacific Northwest from Bigfoot to Mel's Hole, and everything in between. This is what makes life exciting. So why report the normal when we can report the Pacific North Weird? Right here at spacedoutradio.com. Oh, there's only one way to rock. Loud and proud. In high definition, Radio 702 Rocks, Las Vegas. Every Saturday and Sunday night, as Dave Scott wanders aimlessly in the wilderness, you can come hang out with me, James Tyson, and Spaced Out Weekend. Starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, I'll take you along as we talk with some of the best experts in their fields. SpacedOutRadio.com is the place to find us, so sit down, relax, put your feet up, enjoy the topics like the paranormal, supernatural, intuitiveness, and so much more. Hope to see you there. Don't have time to listen to Spaced Out Radio Live? Wherever you are, the car, the office, the shower, or even if you're traveling, we're right here for you. Each Spaced Out Radio show can be found on iTunes, TuneIn, and on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. It's the perfect way for you to catch up on our shows. For more information, just head over to our website, spacedoutradio.com, and tune in to us today. The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio. Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. And hit us up on Twitter using the hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Welcome back for hour number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Great to have you with us. Tomorrow night on the program, Frank Faschino and Stanton Friedman are going to join us. We're going to talk the Flatwoods Monster. And we're going to get into aliens, NASA, UFOs. We're getting into it all tomorrow night as the legends Stanton Friedman and Frank Faschino are on Spaced Out Radio starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern Time at SpacedOutRadio.com. We want to welcome in everyone listening in on WQEE 99, Rock the Key, down in Noonan, Georgia, home of the Walking Dead. Thank you so much for being with us. We're also live on the United Public Radio Network on 107.7 FM in New Orleans and over 160 countries around the world. Thank you so much for being with us as well. We're live on KTLK, the Fringe FM, Renegade Talk Radio out of Las Vegas. And if you're listening in on Revolution Radio, Remember, the Double R Machine is a donation station financed by you, the valued listener. Head on over to freedomslips.com and donate today. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. A Blutomania. A Blutomania is your password. Make sure you use it wisely, Space Travelers, as Bill sets a password each and every night right here on the mighty SOR. Are. Now, if you want to follow us on social media, I want to say a shout out on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio to one of our new followers, 
QH Matrix Hologrammers. Thank you so much for listening into the show tonight. Really appreciate you starting to follow us. John, you're looking good as well. Nice hair. Appreciate that. We also can be found on Facebook. Spaced Out Radio Show on Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Tune us in on TuneIn, download this show and others on iTunes. And our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including joining the S-O-R Space Travelers Club for 5 bucks a month, rock out to some Bumblefoot, and you could go to our store, pick up a t-shirt. You could also pick up a poster, a sticker, and you can sign up and buy a VIP ticket for 10% off until July 31st to the first annual Caribou Paracon being held right here in 108 Mile Ranch, British Columbia, September 29th to October 1st. We'd love to have you come up and hang out with a weekend of paranormal fun and adventures. Yeah, us weirdos at Spaced Out Radio would love to have you join us, so come on up. And on our website, you can read up on the encounter online as well. Butch Witkowski from ufocop.com is our monthly feature guest the final monday of every month butch great to have you back good to be back now i have a bunch of questions piling up from our listeners and i know we are getting into mothman tonight and the sightings in chicago and in and around we're going to hit that heavily here but you know us our audience, when they get going, they take this show with you in a totally different direction. So we really have no control, you and I. We really don't. Well, that's good, too. I think it is as well. Let's start off with Tripp's question here. And he is asking, Butch, do you think technology is why no one has any good footage? Seems like roll film and camcorders have caught the best footage. Well... Yes, they have, but I guess the first thing that pops up, even when somebody gets good footage with video or, or a camera, digital or 35 millimeter, the debunkers crawl out from under their rocks, and they've got 5,000 excuses how you did it, why you did it, and why it's no good. But there are cameras that you can't do that to, and um, what they call um, um, a multi multi um Multi-snap cameras are surveillance cameras where uh, a picture is taken every second or every 1.5 seconds, um, and you can't doctor them because they come out, they take a, a strip. So when you're, you're looking at a, paranor- a, a paranormal, you're looking at a para, para, panorama of one picture that goes to six pictures. So if there's something walking, you're you're watching those steps like you would in slow motion because that photograph is being taken every 1.5 seconds. If you disturb those, you've already destroyed that section of pictures. You follow me? So in other words, with one foot being up and the other one down, you might have both feet off the ground because you took one away. And those cameras are, are pretty much foolproof. Again, uh, the infrared cameras... Um, you know, they're seeing stuff in the dark that you won't see with a regular camera, digital or video, unless you're using uh, infrared filters. And even that's not so good. It's best to have a total infrared camera. And then, of course, the FLIR devices, which measure the heat of anything, uh, whether it's whatever it is. I mean, you, you whatever you put your target on uh, with the camera, a little crosshair, just like in a rifle, uh, if you point it at the chest, uh, you know, it's, in, it's cold out, then it's going to register the body temperature, um, those can't be fooled with because you can't change those. There's no way of changing those. You can't put in 10 degrees more or less or uh, add this or take that out. It's just it, it can't be done. So those are the best cameras that uh, right now are the ones that are being used. Um, that's what we use, and I know a couple other researchers that are now using them. And um, But the ones that bother me are, uh, are the ones that bother me are the ones that have a shot of just I'm gonna, just going to use Bigfoot. So you got a shot of Bigfoot, and it's a very good camera, a Nikon or a Canon, very expensive camera, very good lens, uh, uh, you know, very quick, very precise, uh, and everything in the photograph is crystal clear, like the a side of it or above it or below it. I mean, you can pick out flowers, you can pick out birds, you can pick out everything, but the image of Bigfoot himself is all blurred. Now, somebody told me one time that they thought 
maybe they were doing that. They were blurring themselves out. They were messing with the camera. I don't know how they do that, but it just seems strange that you see this beautiful, clear picture of everything. I mean, picture perfect. And then the creature, or whatever standing there, is all fuzzed out. It's just all blurry. That I haven't figured out yet. But, again, keeping an open mind, could something like that change something in the camera or change some? I don't know. I, I can't say yes and I can't say no. Let's get to another question. This one comes from Eric. Many people who own horses have heard stories about Bigfoot braiding their manes. Have you ever followed any of these encounters? In fact, we have three listeners who have actually, in different parts of North America, had this happen with their horses. I've heard the stories, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that and is- I, I don't mean it's like, it's not like a braid where somebody's just twisting hair around. It's a perfect braid. Why do you think Bigfoot would do that? I have no idea. That is the strangest thing. Uh, there was another one where, uh, and, and the story might be 20 years old, and it's out there somewhere on the net, I'm sure. But there was a, a, a gentleman who lost a, a, a two ponies, and a, and, a, and a larger horse that, for some reason, got out of the corral and off they went. And he was looking for them for months and months. He couldn't find these horses, so he pretty much gave up that they were dead or they ran off or somebody stole them. And next thing you know, he shows up one morning, uh, goes out to the corral, and there's the horses. Well fed, clean, healthy, and these strange tracks leading up to the gate to let him in. Mm-hmm. Which he could only describe as very large, somebody barefoot. Yes. Strange so, well, when that happens. Hmm? Strange when that happens. Follow-up question from Eric. Butch, you mentioned earlier a little bit about Bigfoot alien connections. Do you think there is some sort of connection that correlates the two? This may shock everybody on the set right now. I think, my opinion only, uh, I think all of this is connected. The paranormal, the ufology... In the cryptozoology, there's some kind of connection. What it is, I have no idea. I just got this feeling that it's all connected somehow, some way. It's a little deep, but... No, I totally I, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. I think there is something strange to it. And I'll never forget, and, and I apologize to forget who the guest was, but a couple of years ago I had a guest on, and... I mean, when you're almost 700 guests in, you kind of start forgetting sometimes, so I do apologize. You know, I had a guest on who was telling me a story from some campers who heard, you know, these voices coming from the trees, and it was like they were trying to signal each other with whistles and hoots and and all of this, and they were getting a little freaked out. And then all of a sudden, they heard these two big creatures start running as fast as they could through the trees almost to get away and within seconds of that happening there was a ufo putting a light down in the trees like it was Mm -hmm. looking for them Mm -hmm. you know so it really makes me wonder i don't know if you've ever heard that story or not i i even forget where it was i just recall (coughs) hearing that story on the show yeah well yeah there's there's been a couple stories like that um there's one uh they call it the wheat field report and this evidently took place somewhere out in Kansas or Iowa, if I remember correctly. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a long story, but what it boiled down to was uh, a gentleman was out uh, at his farm, you know, putting equipment away for the night. He had cows milked or whatever he did with the animals and all that stuff. And he was putting some equipment away, and he could have swore they heard people talking out in the field. And uh, so he walked out in the field. He didn't see anything. And he thought, oh, well, you know, probably just an echo or something somewhere away. And uh, they, they thought they thought about it a little bit. Oh yeah, there's this campground down the road. It's probably kids playing at the campground or something, or people having a party somewhere. And then he gets back to the house, and as he turns around to shut the garden, uh, the, the the walkway gate, he sees a lot of lights out in the field. And he said it looked like just large lightning bugs all over the place. So he gets a flashlight. He goes out. And he's looking around. He doesn't see it. The lights go off. There's not there, but he hears. Again, voices. So he walks down to that end of the field. He doesn't see anything. 
by the time he comes back, he sees this large um, orb. He described as an orb. Uh, lift out of the field, and up it went and into the sky. And the voices stopped. He's never heard it again. He didn't know what was going on. He reported it to the police. They thought he was out of his mind. And um, uh, he put the report out there and said, oh, you know, here it is. This is what I heard. This is what I saw. End of story. I'll never talk about it again. And he, and he hasn't really. So those cases do exist. I mean, there's a lot of cases out there that we as researchers and investigators, we've never heard of, but they're there. They're out there. And every now and then you'll get some researcher that might have got that story, then they'll share it. But, um, yeah, they're there. Right, they're there. They're out there. Let's get to Ron's question. Butch, how many man hours does one investigation take on average? Oh, on average, uh, that could be 15 minutes if it's a hoax and you're, you know, you're smart enough to figure it out right off the get-go. Or it could be like other cases that we have going on right now. I mean, the bipedal canine cases have been going on since 2014. Uh, the Todd Cease case has been going on since 2009. They're both active cases. Um, we have other cases that go back even further than that. You can't, you can't give up a case... You can't file a case till you have an answer. Now, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, uh, whether you found something or you didn't, or you just got to the end of the rope where there's no more witnesses, there's no more information, or the place you were looking at is no longer there, or somebody died, or the main witnesses died off, or whatever, that's the only thing that'll get it put in the file. Other than that, those are open cases. Uh, those open cases are right in front of me. There are um, eight binders uh, of open cases. And those binders are six foot, uh, six foot, six inches thick, and um, some are near completion, some aren't. Mm -hmm. So I, there's really no end until, like I said, certain circumstances cause it to end. And a lot of times it's just people dying off. You know, you get the report; that it's already late in their life, and until you get into it and just really start looking around and digging and stuff, you know, one will pass away or both will pass away or. Or in, or in some cases, you're dealing with people that are already dead. And pulling that information is like, you know, trying to pull hairs out of a wild cat's butt. Let's get to another question here. This one comes from Eric. Butch, what's your take on Native American lore of Bigfoot watching over their rituals? Uh, well, not only Bigfoot, but, I mean, there, there are many, many, many stories of not only Bigfoot watching rituals, but skinwalkers watching rituals also. Um, in certain tribes, before any ritual is conducted, they will fence off that area uh, to keep skinwalkers out and Bigfoot out. This one comes from Robin, brand new listener this past week or so. He is saying, Butch, I've heard about the Owl Man of Monin. Do you know anything about that? The, yeah, it's, uh, he's basically, uh, matter of fact, that's what they thought the original uh, couple reports out in Chicago were, Owl Man, because the, the second report was uh, three gentlemen that were outside on their break, their lunch break, uh, you know, just sitting out in the parking lot, having their lunch, smoking a cigarette, drinking their coffee, whatever, when they saw uh, this uh, creature uh, standing on top of some, um, I believe it was um, some boxes or some pallets, and they described it as a large owl. And the one gentleman who I believe was from Mexico, I think, uh, described it as what they uh, what they have down there, which is a very large um, owl that comes around in ritualistic forms, and it's very large and and the other guys were saying it was more like a uh, an owl man uh, when it left. Um, but uh, owl man stories are all over the world. You can get them in in uh, especially Japan. Owls in Japan are a big thing. Owl uh, men, owl monsters, owl owl reptiles, uh, owl dinosaurs or dinosaur looking owls, um, and then of course in the paranormal and ufology. Ufology owls are basically um, uh, our UFO brethren in camouflage of some sort uh, to make them look like innocent little owls. 
they've been seen at windows of people that were abducted. They've been seen at uh, scenes of landings, uh, that kind of stuff. But owls are very dominant uh, in the paranormal field and in ufology. That's something we should talk on in another show, because mm-hmm. I'd like to learn more about that case. Mm-hmm. Seth is asking, I'm legally blind. Let's say I've got some evidence. Who do you think, Butch, that Seth could send it to for an honest evaluation? He could send it to me because up until five years ago, I was legally blind. I did not know. Mm-hmm. Yep, I had... Uh cataracts so bad that uh, they were ready to stamp me legally blind and pull my life driver's license and everything. I could not see a nurse uh, that was standing five foot in front of me, holding up her hands and just being a smart ass when she said, how many hand, how many fingers do I have up? I looked at her and said, Thursday. I could not see her. Everything to me was gray. Uh, I had no color vision anymore. Uh, if I would have waited two more months, the right eye would have been totally blind, not savable, and maybe another two or three months on the other eye, and that would have been not savable, but I had cataract surgery, and now I don't even wear glasses. Well, I wear them to read, but I don't wear glasses to drive or anything like that. Lucky you. Yeah, I got plastic eyes. I, mm-hmm. I hate working, wearing glasses, man. hate wearing glasses, but tis what I wore glasses since I was five. So when I walked out after they did the first eye and I could actually see, uh, I, I, you know, beside passing out on the way home a couple times from the anesthesia, when I got home, I sat in my kitchen and I was crying. And my wife came and said, are you in pain? Is there something wrong? And I says, no. And she said, what's wrong? And I said, I didn't know the kitchen was white. <laughs> and I have two dachshunds and they're both red and they always look to me like uh, just a deep shade of gray. So it was like a whole new world for me. But he can send them to me. Uh, uh, he can get uh, direct to me from off our website, com. Just go to the contact page and just send them, and uh, I'll get back to him as soon as I decipher what he's got. And I will take into consideration his eyesight. Catherine is asking, what is the oldest known account that you have researched of Sasquatch and where was it? Uh, Pennsylvania, it probably was 20, 22 years ago. Uh, it was on a farm where there was supposed to be some cattle killed by this creature. Uh, it turned out to be, you know, just a story that was passed on through family members. Um, and it really went nowhere. But the story was that uh, great-grandfather went out to get the cows in, and uh, two of the cows were just pretty much beaten to death. And um, But uh, he said the police recall. We checked with the police. They didn't have any record of it. And we talked to a couple neighbors, and they said, no, they never had cows. <laughs> he said, they raised goats. I'm like, okay. So, you know, uh, old stories. But there are some stories in Pennsylvania that are... I put them in the outrageous category because, you know, why didn't people talk about these more back then when they had them, you know? And, um, but, hey, it is what it is. I mean, you can all, you only get what you're given, you know? You, whatever information you have, somebody gives it to you. You don't find it out on your own, that's for sure, unless you're into the investigation. So I'm sure there's a lot of old cases out there. I mean, we found bipedal cases in 1860. So I'm sure if we went back further, we'd find a lot of Bigfoot cases. Craig is asking, do you think Bigfoot resides in hidden Lemuria? In what? Lemuria. One of those hidden areas. I think Bigfoot can hide pretty much wherever he wants to. He is the hide-and-seek champion of the world. I mean, there's footprints, there's damage done, there's all kinds of stuff. And it's just not here, but it's all over the world, the different types of Bigfoot, Yeti, and et cetera. But uh, let's put it this way. I was hunting one time, and I walked within two foot of a, a large coyote. 
And when I got down at the bottom of the trail, my buddy turned around to me and says, didn't you see that coyote? I said, what coyote? He said, you walked right past it. I said, I didn't see any coyote. And he was two foot away from me. So in the deep, dark woods that we have here in Pennsylvania, like you guys have up in British Columbia, where you can't see five feet in front of your face sometimes, anything could be standing there watching you, and you'd never know it. On one of, a, one of our expeditions, one of my guys was wearing a red and black checkered shirt, and these flannel shirts. And I said to him, I said, walk into the woods and count off your paces. I just want to see for camera depth. And at five, I lost him. I couldn't see him. Five paces in, he disappeared. So could something be in there watching you or just sitting there taking in the, uh, uh, the, the sights? Or could it have been there the whole weekend that we were there? Sure. Let's get to another question here. This one comes from Robin. He is asking, I watched a UFO program where this researcher thinks UFOs also come from out of the bottom of the ocean. Do you believe there are USOs? Oh, yeah, I do. That I do. Look, uh, this planet is, what, 85% water? And we've only actually mapped like 10% or 15% of it over all these years. There could be anything down there. We'd never know it. And there are a lot of reports on uh, craft being seen coming out of the water and going into the water. Um, so the problem with that type of investigation is, you know, where do you get a submarine to go look? Or where do you find something deep enough to go into those deep channels in the ocean floor? I mean, they're just they're still finding stuff from World War One and World War Two that they didn't even know existed that's down there. Um, look how long it took them to find the Titanic or the battleship Bismarck. I mean, 50, 60, 70 years, 100 years, look, find some of these ships. And now, what was it, just uh, last month and a month before, they found uh, two Spanish galleons off, off the coast of India. Uh, so, I mean, look, it, it, it's such a vast area, and to, and to cover that area... You know, it, that's probably why nobody's ever mounted any type of an ex, expedition to do that because it'd probably just be impossible. There's no way, and the cost of it would be horrendous unless you're at a place where there have been a number of sightings that you can sit on land and, you know, set up your little beach shack or whatever you're going to do and watch it 24-7. There have been military reports from our military and other militaries around the world where uh, they've uh, documented stuff coming out of the water and going into the water. Even in British Columbia here, there's a couple of lakes about an hour east of Vancouver where people have seen UFOs go into those lakes. And the funny part about it is both uh, there is a hydroelectric dam that actually separates both those lakes. It's very interesting. Almost like it's refueling. Yeah, and, and Eric just brought up a really good point, and what he's saying is a fact. Even Columbus, in his diary, saw a UFO. So then you have all these other places, you know, uh, these, these triangles and these areas where uh, continual plane crashes or continual uh, sinkings, and they're not only on the ocean, they're in lakes. You know, the bottom of, the, uh, bottom of Lake Erie is filled with ships that went down, uh, as is Lake Michigan and every other big lake in this, in this country. So are they gone down or are they pulled down? Gail has a question for you. She says, Butch, what do you ultimately plan to do with all the evidence you have gathered? I'm going to send it to Gail and let her handle it. You know what? She used to be a researcher. She could probably handle that. Uh, actually, uh, when I get to the point where I'm going to retire from this, because I'll probably be too old to get around anymore, uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my top investigator and let him carry on because he's only 47. I'm 70, and uh, uh, I'm you know I'm in good health. I get around. I have no problem there. But eventually, they'll have to. It'll have to come to a stop. You know, I just won't be able to keep up with it. Uh, but uh, I've already made arrangements for um, stuff to go to different researchers that I know will carry on, and. Um, 
we are uh, with some of these cases that we've worked on for a long time that I mentioned earlier, like uh, the C's case and, and a few of these other cases that are very long cases. What we're probably going to do with those is we're going to bring those to an end eventually, probably within the next year or two, and then we're just going to do a white paper and put it out, and people can make their own choice and decision on what they think it is. Gloria is asking, Butch, would you please update us on the Todd C's case? Sure. Uh, we've got some other contacts uh, that we've made uh, recently, uh, I'm going to say within the last six, seven months. Um, one is a uh, retired uh, Pennsylvania State Trooper who was not at the scene that night, of the disappear- day of the disappearance, but two of his officers were, and they related to us some stuff that they saw that was not in any of the original reporting, and uh, we're in the process of checking up on that. We've also got another family member that came forward and has given us some information that we were looking for for a long time, which uh, cleared up a couple things that we weren't quite certain about, but we didn't want to put out because we didn't know if they were true or not, but we got that information, so that has been entered into the file. It's ongoing. Uh, It's not... uh, in this whole time we've been working this case, we've never gotten a whole bunch of information at one time. We've always gotten a little bit of information over a period of time, and um, it continues that way till today. But uh, we haven't stopped on the case. It's still active, and um, it is a very uh, interesting case because there's a lot of twists and turns in it and a lot of strange things that have happened in that case. And... Uh, you know, when we're done with it and it comes out, people are just, I know there's a bunch of people just going to sit back and go like, no way. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And um, uh, some other cases that we've worked on uh, are working on uh, the same thing. When we come to an end, uh, we're not going to just shelf, shelf it. I mean, because there's a lot of interest in a lot of those cases. We're just going to put them into a white paper and, um, you know, just put it out to the public. Put it on our websites and uh, let the public decide what they think. Let's get to another question. This one comes from Joe, and Joe is asking, things happen around here, he's on the California-Nevada border, that he can't explain, but Mm -hmm. they happen months, sometimes years apart. How do you investigate someplace where things don't always happen? Well, you know, when you get a case like that, you know, uh, all the basic information is the very first thing you get, you know, and then the location and then the background research on the location and and uh, um, uh, what may have or may not have taken place in that area. And you don't just generalize it to the specific area the individual is giving you. You know, go out 50, 100 miles if you have to. Sometimes search the state or the whole state or states around it. Um, and... Uh, but usually that's not that much of a problem anymore, of course, with the Internet and mapping and, and satellite uh, uh, imaging and stuff like that, um, and researching uh, newspapers and libraries isn't as hard as it used to be where you had to go down to the newspaper, you had to run up to the library. Uh, now you can all do it from your office. And uh, we have researchers in California, both North and South California, uh, I have researchers in Utah, um, Oklahoma. So, you know, we co- we cover the West pretty good. And, um, but um, if somebody's got a question or, you know, it might be something I already have in my database, they're, you know, welcome to contact me. I'll share that information with them. No problem there. Mm-hmm. Ron is asking, in all honesty, Butch, what's the likelihood you would review anything from general public? Not trying to offend, just wonder what volume of information is sent to you, you know, and can you address every submission? Well, there are five of us here in this state that share uh, going over cases. Um, If I would get, say I'd get five cases tonight, I may be able to tackle one or two of them, and I'd I'd send the other ones out to other investigators to get into. Um, One of the things is when you're an independent researcher, uh, you better have help because as as your name gets out there and you get more information or you solve more cases, the more stuff you get. And uh, the volume over, I've been doing this now 27, 28 years now, um, and the amass of information and database is just, it's overwhelming. I mean, if I had to send somebody a database, 
uh, they better be sending me a 32 gig card to put it on. Um, but uh, the difference between uh, looking at things and, and, and categorizing them is the biggest thing. So um, we have a plot, what we call a plot plan. And, you know, it's just a, 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 a Microsoft Office thing, and we just layer them as they come in, and we take the older cases first, and then those we can research those. You know, there's not a hurry for them. They're old cases. I mean, but the newest cases get priority. So, like, if something happens tonight or last week, I mean, that's a priority case. Uh, if something happened 35 years ago, that's not a priority case. But you'd be surprised how much you can accomplish. Now, I'm retired, so I do this full time. Uh, it's not like I got to get up at work at five o'clock in the morning and you know work till tomorrow afternoon. I mean, I'm here, so I can pretty much, if I get onto something, I can sit here for the rest of the night and into tomorrow morning. It's no big deal. But we try to spread it out, and especially if it's in areas like Missouri where we have folks, if it's in their area, I send those reports right to those those people. So it's not just one guy or two guys. You know, there's like 16 people out there that can handle these reports. And, um, you know, when I started U4COP, that's what I wanted. I didn't want cases to disappear, fall through the cracks, or let somebody out that gave us an information, let them out there hanging, waiting to hear from us. I mean, we'll get back to anybody within 24 hours. Now, if it's a photograph uh, or a series of photographs that you need me to look at, uh, may take a day or two, but no longer than that usually. Um, with the programs we have, uh, if it's a report, a database report, if it's um, if I if I have a time, a place, a date, uh, um, an area, or an exact an exact location, even just latitude and longitude, I mean I can get back to somebody within just a matter of hours with a database answer. Mike is asking when collecting evidence, what is best for containing it? Plastic baggies, paper bags, envelopes, what do you suggest? Well, <clears throat> it depends on the type of evidence you're going to collect. If you're going to be collecting, like, say, hair samples, um, uh, I'm sure everybody knows what stamp collecting is or money collecting, people that collect money as a hobby. You can get these uh, uh, wax envelopes. Uh, well, they look like wax. It's actually some kind of cellophane. Um that are archival proof so that means that they are pure they're not there's nothing in there that could hurt there's no acids in there that could hurt your sample or you could uh, uh ball jars that you could buy at any grocery store buy a case of ball jars the small ball jars you know for, to make jam and stuff uh they're already clean they're sterile uh just don't open them up and play with them you know keep the lid on them till you use them uh, then you can go otherwise. You know, there's a company that I use for all our stuff, which is called Searchy Incorporated, and Searchy uh, sells jars, bags. Uh, best thing to keep, um, like samples of um, a broken branch or tree or or leaves or anything like that. It's a plain paper brown bag. Just buy it new. Don't use something you had your lunch in yesterday. Uh, plastic bags, I'm not too happy with. Um, they're okay if you're going to be collecting solid objects like you know, some rocks or something or broken glass, that kind of stuff. But they're not really good for um, specimens like scat or hair um, or flesh. Or And as far as um, uh, fluids, like if you came across a puddle uh, or a blood, uh, then there's certain uh, kits that you have um, to do that. And that really is a, a swab that is filled uh, in a container, a tube, like a test tube, and there's a, a formaldehyde-like mixture in there uh, that doesn't affect blood. And you take the sw you unscrew it, the swab comes out of the solution, you swab it, you put it back in, you screw it tight, and it's tight, and you don't have any leaks, and you have preserved your sample. Evidence is very important, and the cleaner you keep it, never touch anything without gloves on. Nitrite gloves are the best gloves to use. Don't use ones with powder in them. Uh, and when you're done with your gloves, uh, peel them off. Turn, you know, when you peel them off, you'll peel them off. They automatically turn inside out. Have a trash bag with you or a paper bag to throw them in. When you get home, destroy them, burn them, do whatever you want with them. But don't put them back in the truck or your car or your bag. Get rid of them. Um, they're cheap. You can get them at any CVS or any drugstore, a hundred for about six bucks. Um, and I don't care what you're handling. Uh, even if it's a piece of dirt that you're going to take or uh, scraping off of something, um, 
Uh, people always say, what kind of tools do you use for that? Well, you can use a pocket knife or you could, on, on eBay, you can buy old dental tools, uh, you know what I'm saying, and scrape or, or modeling tools for clay. Uh, they all have the little shovels and stuff. So there's little things that you can get that have nothing to do with any investigation type of equipment, but they work. And um, uh, when you're collecting fluids, make sure that the jar that you're putting them in or the container is tight. And uh, always tape your container, whatever it is, bag or whatever, put tape over it so you can tell if it was tampered with because you're going to turn it over to somebody for investigation, maybe a lab or something. Put your initials on there and date it and the time you put them in the bag or box or jar or whatever you're using. And uh, when they, uh, when that person gets it, uh, you know, your chain of evidence is very important. I mean, you're not going to give it to your Uncle Bob who's going to drop it off at the post office maybe in a month or two. Uh, that, that doesn't work because if you do get something, you do get something that's a hit, you want to make sure that forensically that evidence is properly cataloged and the chain of command on that evidence is solid. Otherwise, somebody's liable to step in front of you and saying, look, that's not his bag, that's my bag. I found that. And you're out. Follow-up question for Mike, because he is worried about contamination of a sample. That's his big concern. So is it just a matter of wearing rubber gloves just so that way there's no DNA transferred over from a human? Right, yeah. You you want to... You want to uh, Avoid yourself from any contact with whatever you're picking up. And to do that, nitrite gloves uh, or uh, uh, even if you're going to use a pocket knife or your, your hunting knife or something to cut something, uh, a sample of something, um, uh, we carry uh, alcohol swabs with us in our pack when we're out in the field. Uh, take that alcohol swab out and swab that knife down, and, you know, you're going to get 90% of the germs that are on there. And do what you got to do, and then, you know, wipe your knife off, put it back. But don't ever take a knife that you just got done, you know, cutting your ham and cheese sandwich with and use it to take a sample. So everything you need to do is just remember one thing. Clean. Whatever you're picking up, even whatever it is and how dirty it is, whatever you're picking it up with and whatever you're going to deposit it in needs to be clean and not touched. Now, that doesn't go for a, a footprint that you just cast. I'm just talking about samples of hair, uh, scat, bone, um, anything like that. You don't know. You don't want to touch it. I'll tell you another thing that works really good. Uh, uh, um, test tube thongs, like you had in high school. You pick the little test tube up, and it's got the little gripper on the end. Those are great for picking things up and not touching them if you don't have gloves. And they're very small. They're very cheap. They're like four bucks, I think, for brand new ones, good ones. Put them in your pack. You want to pick something up. Uh, do you ever see these things old folks use uh, to uh, lift stuff off of shelves? You can buy them at uh, usually medical supply stores. Uh, you pull the thing, and it's like an extension of a, a gripper on the end, rubber gripper. If you don't want to touch anything or you think it might be contaminated or something you just don't want to touch, you can use that to pick it up and put it into a container. A uh, container must be clean. Your hands can't touch it, and you're good. What about for feces? Uh, best thing to do there is um, whatever your container is, you want to, um, we use um, tongue depressors. Like you get at any medical spray, you buy it at a drugstore. Just take your tongue depressors and just, you know, use it like chopsticks, one in each hand, and just pick it up and have somebody keep the container open and just drop them in. You're not touching them. When you're done with those sticks, bury them, throw them away, burn them, do whatever you want with them, but don't put them in the bag because you've already touched them and you didn't have gloves on. Now, if you had gloves on and you did all that, throw them in the bag with the with the sample or jar or whatever you're using. I'll tell you another thing that works good uh, and very inexpensive, too, and you can buy, like, small half-pint paint cans empty at a paint store. You can buy a case of those for like 10 bucks, And when you close them, they're closed and it's sealed. They, they work good too. Butch, I, I'm very amateur at this. And, and you know my partner Mike is, is just as amateur, but he's one hell of an outdoorsman. Okay. 
for people who are amateurs who want to say drive along the logging roads or or the hiking trails to look for signs and because they've heard there's reports in the area and it's just intriguing to them and they want to check it out maybe to possibly get some sort of visual or just feel for the area what do you tell newbies going into this field what should they be looking for because i know with me i'm always looking eyes on the ground but because i'm an amateur outdoorsman and when i say amateur i wouldn't even rank on a scale of 10 1 to 10 okay but i'm doing the best that i can and there's a lot of people like that so break it down what you would tell the newbies going out into the field Okay, well, number one, the most important is don't go out alone. That's number one. Um, be aware of the environment you're in and the animals that inhabit that environment and be prepared for them because they're there. You're in, your, you're in their land now. And then uh, as far as investigative techniques, uh, what we found works the best. Now, we go out in more than two, but if, if I just had one more person with me, I'd have one person watching around us while I did the ground thing and the tree thing and the little path thing. And um, so one set of eyes on the ground, and, and let's say you're going to do a section of road that's a half mile long. Okay, so you're going to walk down the right-hand side of that road, and you're going to check everything you can for footprints or, or tree bends or anything like that. And at the same time, you're, you're accompan- the guy that's accompanying you, uh, is looking all around, uh, making sure there's you know nothing sneaking up on you, uh, that uh, you're not missing anything higher up off the ground like broken branches or or a deer carcass or something uh, that you you may want to collect because it might be something bipedal or maybe a wolf or whatever and you can tell by bite marks. Uh, and then when you get to the end of your area, turn around and come back and do the same thing. But where people make a lot of mistakes is that they get maybe two guys or four guys, and everybody's looking on the ground. And they're, they're watching the ground, they're following the trail, and they're not looking to the sides, they're not looking up, you know. And they may miss uh, tree branches or a carcass or maybe a pile of scat that's off, off of the path. They've just got their, all their eyes on the path. Look, if you've got one pair of eyes on the path, four pair of eyes ain't going to do any better. But I always say go up one side and come down the other. And always have in your mind a, a set of area that you're going to cover. You know, if you walk five miles, <laughs> you're, by the time you get to mile two, you're bored to death if you haven't found anything. And you could walk right by some really good evidence. So you want to keep that distance that you're going to travel for investigation short. Uh, I find best to do like in 300 yards increasements. And, you know, a uh, pile of rock or put a stick in the middle of the trail or something like that, that here's three, well, here's our 300 foot, so now we, we're going to go from here forward and then come back, and you know you've already covered that area instead of coming back and going over the same area you just went. It's, it's just a lot of common sense of um, with the resources you have, trying to make the best out of those resources. And if it's one or two guys or four guys or six guys, it's still really good to have eyes in every direction because, like I said, you know, you could be walking along and this thing would be standing there watching you. You'd never know it if your eyes are pasted to the ground or something could be following you or watching you from a tree. You don't know. No, I can totally see that. And, you know, a lot of people think that they have to, like you said, walk for miles and miles where the track or the evidence might be just a few feet into the bush coming off yeah. a coming off a deer trail. Yeah, exactly. So when when you tell people, okay, to get things going, how much of what you do from your experience then has become intuitive? And when I say intuitive, you know, there's a lot of times where I will go into the forest and I'll just feel like this is an area I have to stop and look. Most of the time, you know, maybe because I'm untrained, I'm not finding anything. Do you find that when you are out for a search, you're using your intuition as much as you are your technology? Yes, absolutely. Um, That bark that you hear in the distance may be more than a bark, so instead of passing it off as a bark, you want to stop and listen. It may be more than a bark. 
um, a rustle in the in the brush behind you or a side of you could just be a deer or a coyote but then again it could be something a lot bigger and nastier um like i always say as far as intuition it's the awareness of your location you know you're not in your den you're not sitting in your car truck you're out there where things could really go bad quickly and you want to be prepared for that now, I'm not saying everybody goes out there with a rocket launcher and an armored personnel carrier, but, uh, I mean, you know, cell phones are to be used. I mean, uh, radios, if you got them. Uh, there should always some, be somebody that knows where you are at all times. Wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, uncle, cousin, doesn't matter. Somebody needs to know where you are that if they don't hear from you at a certain time, they know to get somebody rolling to check it out and find you. And you won't believe how many people do not do that. I mean, I go six, 700 miles away from my home. My wife knows exactly where I am. I have a phone that's built into the truck. I have a phone on my hip, and I have another phone on my pack. So uh, if I say to her, I'm going to call you at, uh, I got here at 6 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to call you at 10 o'clock, if I don't call her within 30 minutes to 10 o'clock, she knows who to alert because she knows where I'm at. So it's not that accidents don't happen, but they do happen. You don't want to be caught with your pants down out there. I mean, it, most of it is common sense, and it amazes me to some of the people I go out there. You know, they're, they're out looking for Bigfoot, right? They're wearing flip-flops and shorts and a T-shirt, and they got a pocket knife that's probably so dull they couldn't cut cheese with it. And that's it. That's what they're doing. I, I just hope nobody ever takes that kind of advice. Uh, you should be prepared for the elements. I mean, twist an ankle in the woods. You're pretty much screwed. <laughs> you know, you're going to be, first thing you're going to be doing is trying to figure out how you're going to make a crutch or a, or a cane with that butter knife that you got in your pocket that's been there for three years. What if, what if it's margarine and not butter? Yeah, but it's all common sense. No, I hear you. I'm, I'm just throwing some sarcasm. I've there. seen these guys out there. They scare me. You know, they, they got earphones on. They're listening to music, you know, with the earphones, and they got the floppy hat on with the sunglasses and the flip-flops and shorts. Now they got camouflage shorts, so I'm sure that's a plus on their part. But no knife, no no pack, no nothing, no water. They're out there just marching along like nothing's going to happen. Those are usually the people you read about in the books 411 that they're never seen again. Mm -hmm. I can see that. I can see mm -hmm. that. Eric Cooper, who has 19 and a half years with the United States Army, retired, says, Getting to the wilderness survival aspect, Butch, do you think Bigfoot or cryptid TV shows offer a disservice to the public without showing it? Oh, yeah, Absolutely. These, these Bigfoot encrypted TV shows are amazing. I, I mean, I've met some of these folks in person, and um, it's all show. Um, uh, people can, you know, when they're firing at an underwater creature in the uh, lake or a pond and there's no splash from bullets, you know they're shooting blanks. And there's no recoil when they're firing a weapon. They're shooting blanks. And everybody, everything that they do in a lot of these shows is, it's a disaster waiting to happen. I mean, they're going in like they're going to be killed. They're, they're going into combat, you know. Uh, they got shotguns, they got rifles, they got handguns, they got, you name it, they got it, spears. I mean, they're loaded for bear. And then when you find out that all this filming is done in their backyard, uh, which they don't tell you, of course, then you really realize how much bull crap is out there and how it sets off real researchers going in the wrong direction. You know? And, um, look, if, if, if I could carry a firearm in these state parks, yeah, I would, but I can't and I don't want to. So I have enough know-how to do with what I can do with what I got. And um, um, I, I just think that these... These uh, Bigfoot encrypted shows 
are a, a huge disservice to people that want to get involved because there's basically it's it's a fear factor. They're just scaring the shit out of everybody, and for no reason whatsoever. They don't find anything. Um, hell, the one guy was running through the woods, and the dumb jerk actually ran into a tree and knocked himself senseless. So um, I don't recommend running in the woods in the dark. Um, I don't. We don't go in the woods like that at all. I mean, if I'm looking for something, I go to where the sighting was, set up what I got to set up, and I sit with my mouth shut and listen and watch. Uh, I'm not apt to be running through the woods in the middle of the night, you know, screaming and yelling and throwing out donuts and pork chops, nailing on trees. And No, that's just not the way it's done. And it's funny, I talked to an old researcher. Oh, he's been researching for, oh, God, maybe 50 years. He said, we never did wood knocks when we were looking for Bigfoot. Nobody ever knocked back. We never did that. We saw Bigfoot. I'm going like, oh, okay. <laughs> he said, God help us. We never threw out donuts. We ate the donuts. I ain't giving nobody donuts. He said, I'm not out here. He said, this isn't a mutual society where I'm going to go out and feed animals in the woods. But it's just the way the paranormal shows them the same way. Everything they see is a ghost. Every little bit of dust that pops up on the cameras, some paranormal orb. And, um, you know, uh, it, it's no, I, I don't even give them credence. I watched one show one time and that was it. End of story. And, and Butch on that note, we're going to hop out for our final break of the night here on spaced out radio, two hours down one hour to go as we continue to talk cryptids and all things strange and weird. Your questions as well, space travelers, so keep them coming. Butch is here the final Monday of every month with his feature, Strange Days. You can also check out Butch's website, uforcop.com. That's UFO. R C O P dot com, UF4COP dot com. More with Butch Wachowski on Space Out Radio right after this. We'll be back right after the break. Looking for a great weekend getaway this fall? Hi there, this is Dave Scott. Come on up to the heart of British Columbia for the first annual Spaced Out Radio Caribou Paracon, being held at the Spruce Hill Spa and Resort in 108 Mile Ranch, British Columbia. Speakers from all over North America are coming to discuss Bigfoot, UFOs, ghosts, and intuitiveness for the three-day event, September 29th to October 1st. For more information, go to spacedoutradio.com and click on the Caribou Paracon banner and book your tickets today. Come to BC, where the paranormal is waiting for you. The SOR Sightlines is a place for you to find answers to your strange experiences. Hi there, this is Mike Schmidt. If you have had an encounter with ghosts, UFOs, Bigfoot, ETs, or anything else that doesn't make sense, head to spacedoutradio.com and file a Sightlines report. All information you give is 100% confidential, and I will personally help you find the answers you need. SOR Sightlines. Your answers are a click away. Have you got your Cosmic Passport? If you need one, tune in to Cosmic Passport on Spaced Out Weekend. This is Elizabeth Anglin, ET experiencer, spirit medium, and host of Cosmic Passport. Each weekend, I'll be bringing you interviews and support from other paranormal experiencers and the best in intuitive spiritual guidance from across the globe. It's all happening starting at 9 p.m. Pacific Time, midnight Eastern, on spacedoutradio.com. Hi there. I'm Butch Witkowski, lead investigator with you 4 cop On the final Monday of every month, you can listen to me and host Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio's Strange Days. We're going to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to what's happening out there. People are seeing and experiencing things from ET contact to Bigfoot, and I want to hear about it. Your experiences are what we investigators need to help solve these unknown mysteries, so tune in at spacedoutradio.com to the final Monday of every month from Butch Wachowski's Strange Days. This is your medium, Joanna, from Spaced Out Weekend, Two Mediums and a Large. I would love it if you would come and join us with host James Tyson every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. Together, we will take your calls and your questions live. Our goal is to provide you with a positive outlook on deep questions that you may have. Questions regarding love, relationships, money, or whatever else is on your mind. Come and check us out at spacedoutradio.com. This is Eric Markham, news editor for Spaced Out Radio's The Encounter Online. We have put together a great team of writers and journalists from all over the world to bring you top-quality paranormal stories 
From alien counters to the latest conspiracies, you won't find any of that fake news here. True stories and top-notch reporting as we look to bring these experiences to the mainstream. The Encounter, online, only at spacedoutradio.com. Patrolling the Pacific Northwest, we are always on the lookout for the strange and unassuming stories that real people are experiencing. Hi, I'm Vincent Zunza from Pacific North Weird. Me and Alexandra Sullivan have teamed to bring to you those odd stories that never seem to make it into the mainstream. Stories so weird that we'll leave you scratching your head wondering, is this real? It's as real as it gets with Pacific North Weird. You can watch our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. Become more intimate and interactive with Spaced Out Radio. Join our Space Travelers Club with your new membership. For $5 a month, we'll provide you with special access to the website, monthly prize draws from books to psychic readings, along with monthly newsletter, private interviews, and more. Sign up today to be part of Spaced Out Radio's experience. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio, or our website including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Don't have time to listen to Spaced Out Radio Live? Wherever you are, the car, the office, the shower, or even if you're traveling, we're right here for you. Each Spaced Out Radio show can be found on iTunes, TuneIn, and on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. It's the perfect way for you to catch up on our shows. For more information, just head over to our website, spacedoutradio.com, and tune in to us today. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Strange creatures lurking in the night, the sounds of wood knocking in the forest, odd happenings right out of a fictional world. These are the reports I love. Hi there, this is author Ronald Murphy, and I would love it if you'd join me and Spaced Out Radio host Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month on our journey into the unknown land of cryptozoology at spacedoutradio.com. From Mothman to Frogman and everything in between, hey, they don't call me the crypto guru for nothing. Did you know that Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi, it's James Tyson from Spaced Out Weekend. Every Saturday and Sunday night, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, you can join me and my guests for some great chatter about what's going on out in the universe or even in that dark part of the basement you really don't want to go back into. Well, let's find the answers to your experiences together. So come on up to Uncle Jimbo's cabin on the weekend. For more information, look us up at spacedoutradio.com. The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio. Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and hashtag Spaced Out Radio. And on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. And thank you for continuing this ride as we do it every single night here at SpacedOutRadio.com. Tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time, we talk the Flatwoods Monster, UFOs, Aliens, the Legends, Stanton Friedman, and Frank Faschino will be with us as we get things going at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. Now, if you want to follow us on social media, you can do that. But first, got to get to the password. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. A Blutomania. 
A Bluetomania is your password. What the hell it means, nobody really knows, not even the Oxford Dictionary. A Bluetomania is your password, space travelers. Make sure you use it wisely, as Bill sets a password each and every night right here on the mighty SOR. Now, if you're on Twitter... You can follow me at Dave, uh, make that, what is my Twitter handle? At Spaced Out Radio. Use the hashtag Spaced Out Radio if you want to connect with us live during the show as well. You can give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. Follow me on Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Tune us in on TuneIn, download this show and others on iTunes. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal, our resident guitar god. You can check him out. Read up on the encounter online. You can also go to our Spaced Out Radio store, where you can become an SOR space traveler. You can pick up a t-shirt like Teresa. You can also get a poster, stickers. And if you're looking for a weekend getaway, September 29th to October 1st, come hang out with the weirdos of Spaced Out Radio at our first annual Spaced Out Radio Caribou Paracon being held in 108 Mile Ranch, British Columbia at the Spruce Hills Spa and Resort. Up until July 31st, you can get VIP tickets for the weekend at 10% off. Tonight we are talking with Butch Witkowski from UFOrcop.com. Butch is a talented and aggressive investigator of all things paranormal. And Butch comes on this show the final Monday of every month for his feature called Strange Days. Butch, welcome back. I'm here, ready to go. All right, let's get back to the questions. Michael is asking, have you ever heard of any stories of Bigfoot being seen in trees? Uh, one actually, <laughs> um, it turned out to be uh, a pile of moss, but from the road, it, it really did look like there was something in the tree. Uh, but when, uh, they came back the next day with a few folks and walked in, it was still there and it was a bunch of moss hanging in a tree. Um, the, it would have to be a big tree because these things would be really huge in weight, you know, and, climbing trees be breaking branches making all kind of noise or they could have been there when you walk by uh so yeah it's possible why not i mean look at some of the territory they've been seen in uh rocky mountains that you know take you a day to climb and they're seen walking up the side like it's nothing there's a great shot of one in um i believe it was alaska where some hikers were on one mountain looking across watching something walk on the other mountain and was walking up the mountain like it was walking down a flat street. And they were struggling to get through the snow and up the mountain. So, yeah, I don't put anything past them. I think they could do pretty much anything they want to do. Let's get to another question. Robin is asking, will Bigfoot divide and conquer if there are two of them? Hmm, good question. Um... I know there's a researcher out there, I can't remember his name, that's how he came up with this information or how he figured it out, I have no idea, but he said they're very territorial and um, they respect each other's territories, they don't wander in each other's territories. Um, I, I just don't know how he would know that, but um, as far as uh, dividing and conquering, you know, uh, a mountain lion will do that. A mountain lion will uh, run people off in one direction and come back and get the one that's standing there waiting for them to come back. The one that really stands out with that, Divide and Conquer, was uh, a group of photographers, and that was in Colorado in la last year, I believe it was, where four or five photographers were walking in a line just taking pictures of everything, you know, very scenic area they were in. And uh, the one guy saw something run through the brush, and... Everybody but the one girl took off after this thing, tr trying to get a picture, and it had doubled around and attacked the girl and killed her instantly and drug her off, and they got back just to see the part where she was drugged into the bush, and they found her two days later. Let's get to Mike's question. Mike is asking, Butch, do you have any thoughts on Bigfoot gifting sites? How does one determine a good spot in an area of interest? Uh, usually where the sighting took place. Um, so if, um, if you have a report or somebody has a sighting, uh, say, um, off of a trail, 
uh, and that's the last place. The last place it was seen. Um, that's where I understand that gifting should begin. The last area it was seen in, and uh, people have used everything for gifting: uh, toys, food, uh, articles of clothing. Uh, there's one gentleman that actually goes to these flea markets and he buys um, 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 what they call costume jewelry, and he usually gets the shiniest baubles he can get and he hangs them on trees where the last sighting was and he's come back and had them um, moved up in trees or moved to another tree close by but they were definitely moved Um, uh, people have left you know fruit baskets Uh, uh, one guy left a book and when he came back like every tenth page was pulled out of the book now that's uncanny (laughs) But uh, it, it's pretty much everybody goes by the last place or the last location that was seen. Are you a fan of gifting sites? Do you think that they actually work or that are you still a little concerned that it's maybe not raccoons or, or other critters running around the forest that are, that are, you know, getting into these, you know, containers of whatever it may, whatever I, it may I, be? I think it could be anything like that. Uh, you know, raccoons will go after anything, especially food. Uh, it's the ones that where they hang something in a tree pretty high up at the very edge of the tree where if an animal had walked on it, it would have knocked it off. Uh, but then it's removed from that tree and it's moved over to another tree close by and about the same height, you know, in the same position it was left in the, to begin with. Those are kind of odd. This is true. This is true. I'm wondering some of the good things that you have heard coming out of gifting sites. Uh, I think the best one yet, uh, and um, I'm in contact with the gentleman every now and then we talk, uh, where he would leave something, um, a bobble or whatever, he would leave something in a certain area, and... um, he would come back and what he left was gone but there was always something in its place now it might be um, uh, an acorn or or a pine cone or a rock uh, but what he did was he made like a little teepee out of sticks and then he would put this object into that little teepee and um uh, he would put the objects in, he'd go back a month later, and that object would be gone, but there would be something else there, like a toy. Now, he didn't leave a toy, so where did the toy come from? Or uh, uh, he's not uh, too keen on the food stuff, but he, he leaves objects, and uh, like he bought an old set of keys at a yard sale, and he threw the keys in there, and there were ten keys on a ring. Well, when he came back, there were only nine keys on the ring. So it was whatever it was was intelligent enough to open that key ring, take that key off, and put the other keys back. Six months later, he went back to check his little tent that he had set up there, his little teepee or whatever it was, and uh, what he had left in there earlier, which was some kind of bauble, a necklace or something like that. The necklace was gone, but the old key was there. Now, you know no humans doing that. Not out in the middle of nowhere where this guy lives, and he lives in the middle of nowhere. I always find that people who do these gifting sites seem to have the most gentle interactions with this creature. Mm-hmm. Do you do you find that as well? Yes, I do. Yep. Mm-hmm. Is that because of a mutual respect? I think it's a communication of some sorts between the two that is not physical or with language it's just you know uh i know you're here here's something for you and then the other side goes uh thank you i know you were here so here's something for you and um he's been doing it quite a while and it's still going on so either he struck up some kind of connection uh, you know who knows but it is intriguing to think about it Let's get to some questions from the audience. Trip okay. is asking, 
Butch, do you think big feet break trees and stack them in a teepee form for shelter or markings, or is this done from humans? Well, uh, you know, if you walk into any forest, uh, you're going to see trees laying all over the place, laying up against each other uh, in different forms. Uh, some hunters go out and they build these little things, you know, to sit in while they're hunting deer. Um, the ones that always kind of caught my eye were the ones where the tree, it was a fresh tree, you know, not some old rotted thing. It was a fresh tree, and it was broken off high in the ground, uh, high from the ground, not uh, low at the ground. Um, and it was snapped clean off, or it was twisted off. That's another thing. I mean, wind doesn't twist off a tree. Uh, so those those kind of sightings kind of intrigue me a little bit. Because the forest and nature can do some pretty strange things. And. You- you know, it, it, it's always amazing to me, you know, the way a tree can fall or the way it can bend uh, due to the way, it, you know, a windstorm pushes it down or or big animals like a moose or an elk or a bear as they mark their territory as well. So how do we know when it's Sasquatch and maybe not a typical forest critter? I, you know, I, like I said, the only the only one that uh, really intrigues me, I mean, you know, if you see trees laying over, I mean, they could be old, they could be rotted, they could be, you know, a beaver can take them down or, or a, a moose can lean against it and or scratch his back like a bear and knock it over. But the ones that are twisted off. Are twisted off high in this high. When I say high, I mean like eight foot off the ground. Something had to reach up there and twist it and twist it to a point where it breaks off. And that's not something normal. Let's get to another question from our audience here. Eric is asking Butch, have you ever heard or followed any Bigfoot family units? Mm, no. I've heard of one but it wasn't it was just a story it's always interesting to see you know how people's stories come come through do you think that bigfoot then is just a a vagabond of the forest or do you believe that it does have family nurturing that goes along with it because i look at it if if i look at my area we have a lot of deer and the bucks always have the does somewhere around, but the ducks, uh, pardon me, the, the bucks are, are doing their own thing. Yes. They're keeping an eye on the ladies and the family, but as soon as the ladies become family, you know, the bucks kind of scurry off and, you know, kind of like a one night stand and leave them alone, you know, yet, yet, you know, from what I think of Sasquatch, I'm wondering if it's like that or more human where we tend to, you know, stay close to our families for the most part. Well, you know, the Patterson Gimlin film, that was a female, Patty. And um, in some descriptions of the photograph, she, it's like she's carrying a little one. So um, either there's one Bigfoot running around all over the world and when he gets overseas and he gets to the Himalayas, he t- turns his coat white, or there are families of them, groups of some sort. And, um, you know, people say, well, why don't you come across their dead? Well, I mean, how many hundreds and hundreds of years did it take before they found the elephant graveyards in Africa? I mean, they could bury their dead, just like we do. You'd never find them in the woods. You'd never find that. Or or they could have a certain area they put them um, some people say they could cannibalize them too. I find that hard to believe. But um, yeah, I believe there could be family units. There would have to be sex of some sort to keep them gone for as long as they've gone. And little ones have been seen. What's strange is that little footprints have never been found. Let's get to another question. This one from BTO. I consider Bigfoot to be E.T., whereas Sasquatch to be natural. Are there any differences in the species of Bigfoot and or Sasquatch, or are they the same? I think they're all the same. Um, 
the size, the shape, the look, uh, the mannerisms, um, how they move about. Um, they come in varied sizes. You know, you got the skunk ape in Florida. You got the Yeti, which is supposedly much, much bigger than the North American ape, uh, Sasquatch. Um, some areas say their Sasquatch are more aggressive. Um, some say they're more docile. Uh, you know, I, and that's all that's all human uh, interpretation of what they are or aren't. And um, but as far as something out there, there's something out there. We just don't know what it is, and you know. Um, I, I just don't think there's going to be any other way of proving their existence until one is sh one is killed or shows up dead or they find a body. I love this question from Joe. He's saying, "Is it possible Bigfoot have pets like a coyote or a wolf?" Mm, yeah, why not? We have pets. Why not? I mean, you know, uh, we don't know enough about this species. You know, if somebody said to sit down and describe what we know about Bigfoot, you could probably put it on a index card, a three by five index card. We know very little, and what we do know has come from stories, and stories aren't evidence. Um, we have no evidence. Uh, we have tracks, we have prints, um, we have a lot of blurry pictures, we have a lot of first hand accounts, but again, no evidence. And um, uh, a lot of these stories have been put out there by people that either never went out looking for Bigfoot or they wrote a book and they took a bunch of stories off the Internet or from other books or magazines or other publications, put them all in one binder, and all of a sudden there's this great story about Bigfoot. I mean, it's like werewolves, you know. Um, people say to us, well, what's the difference between a werewolf and a bipedal canine? I said, well, werewolves were men that changed on a certain time, whether full moon or, or a certain time of the month, they changed, but they always had clothing on. Where, you know, the bipedals, we don't see any of them with clothes or no reports of clothing. And werewolves go back to Roman times or so. I mean, as you know, you know, it's just like anything else. As time goes on, stories get enhanced and brought into uh, the the more popular uh, culture and the more um, televised or written about or publicized uh, stories. And but as far as following up with researchers. Very, very few people follow up with any researcher on, on, on what they're doing or how they're doing it. Um, I probably get more questions off of your show once a month than I get in a whole year from people. I mean, I get questions about types of equipment to use or uh, data searches or things like that or reports or how to, or look at photographs for them or stuff like that, but... The kind of questions I get from this, you know, your group on a, on that one uh, one day a month is more than I get in a year or two. Well, our, what, our our audience likes to learn, man. Well, it's what people have to do if they want to know. They have to ask. I mean, um, there aren't, uh, you know, uh, if I go on any other show, I mean, with the exception of one or two, where it's kind of like your show, not as not as big and not as long. But um, there are just a couple that do that. Other ones, you know, they'll, uh, you know, they start out the show by, okay, Butch, well, what do you think about Roswell? Well, <laughs> uh, or, uh, you know, do you think King Kong was real? Oh, give me a break. So I try to stay away from those outfits. <laughs> or do I believe in ghosts? Or do I believe in uh, the Loch Ness Monster? You know, that kind of stuff is just silly. Uh, I'm looking for certain things in certain cases, whether it be cryptids or um, ufology or, or Bigfoot, I, or I mean, I'm sorry, cryptozoology. And um, 
that's what I do. Um, I don't really get up in the morning and think about if Nessie over in Loch Ness is going to have breakfast or um, some doll living down in Florida is going to get out of its perch and walk down the street and cause a car accident. I mean, uh, some of the stuff is just ridiculous. But, you know, when you get good questions from people that want to know, and they're not silly. And none of these questions are silly. I mean, they're very serious. I mean, people, if they don't know, they'll ask. And, uh, but some um, folks uh, are just not like that. They don't. They just want the sensationalism and, you know, a butch were you ever chased through the woods by a mad uh, unknown creature. Uh, yeah, a girl one time in high school, but we won't get into that. So, um, you know, it's... Um, it's wild, but your guys are the greatest. I know, you know they've been asking really great questions. They always do. What is? I don't know how many years it is now we're doing this, but they always ask good questions. And they're rarely the same. They're rarely the same. Kudos to I them do. for doing that. <laughs> well, let's just continue on with their questions because... The audience has them packed right now. Corey is asking, do you think that you could bring a Bigfoot into an area to get your gift? If one hadn't even been spotted in that area, if you visited that site often enough, almost as if it were ritual? Uh, you know, that's been tried, and I think it was successful in uh, Washington State where a gentleman who saw one in an area when he was a very young child, and he was now in his 50s, just kept going back to that area and leaving little things. Uh, and uh, I know it took a while, if I remember, like quite a few months, and then he went back one day and there were some things there, and it's been going on steadily ever since. But he hadn't been there for many, many years. I mean, like when he was six or seven years old, and now he was in his 60s. So, yeah, I guess it could be considered like a ritual. If you keep showing up in the same spot, eventually, you know, if they want to know what you're doing in that spot, they're going to look and then yeah, you can take it from there. Let's get to another question. Eric says, Butch, what have you heard about Bigfoot migrations, as in heading higher elevations for the winter? Uh, yeah, that's a big thing with the Bigfoot crowd, uh, migrations. Um when you look at uh, maps or plots of uh, Bigfoot sightings, um, in warmer weather, uh, they move to higher ground. Uh, in wet weather, they move to higher ground. In colder weather, they kind of move around more. Uh, you know, it, it's almost like uh, they move with the weather. But then again, you got to think, too, that what they're moving with the weather, they're probably moving with either the deer herds or they're moving to where, you know, there's uh, crops are coming in, vegetables, berries, uh, blooming, and all that stuff. So, yeah, I, I think it's very possible that they're, they migrate. Because when you see a lot of, uh, a lot of times you'll see a lot of cases out in the West Coast, <laughs> excuse me, and then, you, you know, you'll see very little in the uh, Southwest or the, uh, the Northeast. So, yeah, they could migrate, sure. Well, one, I guess one guy, well, of course, I don't know how he did it, but he said there actually is a migrating group of 2,500 throughout the United States. But, again, I don't know how he ever came up with that number. Butch, I am a firm believer that we don't see Sasquatch. Sasquatch allows us to see him. Do you think there's anything to that? Oh, I agree. Uh, look, I, 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 it's the same thing with the bipedals. Um, you know, we could probably sit there for months and not see anything. Uh, and then we could be packing up to go home, and one could walk out of the woods and just look at us and turn around and walk back in. We don't know. I mean, they um, they seem to be an intelligent creature. Um, uh, so why not? I mean... If I was one of them, yeah, probably would. <laughs> Do you think that's why people have such a tough time in actually spotting them? Is because they may not have that connection that Bigfoot feels is necessary to show itself? Well, uh, you know, you look at... Um, uh, hell, there was a... a, a 
a great video on about six months ago. A guy was fishing up in uh, Washington State. Uh, I'm sorry, Oregon, uh, trout fishing. And him and his buddy are sitting there on their chairs, and, you know, casting their lines in. And a huge, and I mean huge, bear, uh, to me it looked like a brown, uh, walked up to them, stood behind them. Now, they froze. They didn't move. And then it kind of walked up away from them, and it was just looking out over the water. And then it came back and kind of looked at them a little bit and then just walked away, like no fear, no problem. He knew that they weren't, he, he evidently knew they weren't there to hurt him. And he didn't lay a finger on them. He just, he, and he was close enough to just like rip them apart. I mean, he walked right up to them. And they were just calm and just sat there and continued doing what they were doing like he wasn't there. And that was it. So there is an intelligence in the animal kingdom. And I don't care if it's uh, animals we know or the animals we don't know. I, I still think that there's there's an intelligence there, and there could be a compassion also. Shar is asking, Butch, did you ever hear of that guy who claimed to have a Bigfoot body a couple of years ago? Could you go into detail? Oh, yeah. That guy, uh, <laughs> what he did was he bought a, uh, well, there were actually two guys. Uh, the first guy had one in a freezer, and he took a suit and he got a bunch of pig guts and threw that in there, and you know he sealed it all up and then kept it under refrigeration, so it was a uh, uh, this captured. But he was outed by another Bigfoot researcher who actually knew what he did, and uh, he got in a little trouble over that one. Uh, and then the other guy, uh, he, what he did was he had uh, somebody. Uh, they took a suit. And then he had a makeup artist, a uh, Hollywood makeup artist, go over this thing and really make it realistic. And he put it into a, like a, gl a glass encasement. And he had it on a trailer, and he would go around to the, the, the carnivals and, and outdoor fairs, and he would charge you money to go walk through the trailer and view this thing. And um, he said that he was the one that shot it, and uh, he just thought that everybody should see it. Uh, you weren't allowed to touch it. It was all in this sealed glass uh, uh, box. And uh, he eventually got caught also. And um, he builds himself as the world's greatest Bigfoot hunter. Uh, he has shot numerous Bigfoots, according to him. Um, never been able to prove anything. Um, you know, it is what it is. Uh, you'll get people that really go out there and work their tail off to try to get an answer, and then you got guys like these that do what they want. But no, he didn't shoot anything, and the body was a fake. Matter of fact, um, I, I believe it was in Oklahoma when they caught up, the police caught up, and they walked in, they said, open the class case. And uh, he opened it, and it was a dummy. It was a, it was a fake. It was just a stuffed uh, suit that was doctored up to really look real. Let's get to Dennis's question here. Dennis is asking, Butch, what do you think the chance is Bigfoot could be an automated remote organic entity? A robot? Like artificial intelligence almost, I would assume. Okay, um, well. <sighs> no, I don't know. No. Why would something... Oh, well, no, nah, I don't think so. I, I mean, there's too many variables there. I mean... They eat, kill deer. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I just uh, that one doesn't register. I, I I don't have an answer for that. I mean, it just that's kind of weird when you think about it. Now I know that they've had um, people claim to have had telepathic um, communications with these folks, uh, but. I can't say that's not right because we've had that with our bipedals where uh, guys have come up on these things and they've been they've had guns, high-powered rifles and shotguns, and and they get something tells them not to shoot. So is that a telepathic communication between the bipedal and the guy standing there with the gun? Um, it's got to be something because we've had that in more than one case. 
Ron is asking, have you ever investigated in Canada, and would you? Uh, anywhere but Quebec. Last time I was in Quebec, I was so drunk I couldn't even remember what country I came from. That's normal there. That's yeah, normal. it is. Oh, yeah. I went to a sports bar, biggest mistake I ever made in my life. I got there, it was supper time, and when I left, it was supper time again the next day. I've had that happen in Las Vegas. Mm. Mm. I went into a, I went into a bar at daytime and left at daytime the next day. It's yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though, it's a great town. I really had a good time there. I was up there for a wedding, um, but it, it was really, and the people are really nice. Um, I had a good time. Uh, of course, I didn't speak a word of anything, and they could have been saying anything they wanted about me, but I figured they were laughing, so I'd laugh with them. <laughs> I didn't know what they were talking about. Robin is asking, this, this thought comes from the movie Mimic. Would it be possible for any of these cryptids to actually mimic us? Oh, hmm. Like how? I mean, what does she mean by mimic? Well, just Off? just the way we do everything. You know, are they mimicking us while they're watching us? Are they, are they learning about us as we are trying to learn about them? Oh, I, I'm sure they are. Oh, absolutely. Um... Uh, I believe, I'm, I'm thinking of the case, and it, it's a while back, but it's either Colorado or it was in Utah, one or the other, where um, a guy was camping, uh, him and three other guys that were camping. They were just out camping. They go to the same place every year. It was like on a, like a mesa, flat mesa. And there's a, a river down below, and they went down, and they, you know, showered, took their bath, not showered, but they went down, took their bath, washed up, whatever. Then they went back up to the mesa, and they were starting supper, and they looked, and they claimed a, a Bigfoot came down and, like, washed up in the stream, uh, the little river like they did, and then went back up, and then he was squatted down, just like they were squatting down on the other side of the river, and they were cooking, and he was making gestures like he was doing something like cooking, but he wasn't cooking. And then the one guy just stood up and started yelling at him and waving at him with one hand, you know, like, hey, how you doing? this And, and it stood up and waved back. So, yeah, I guess it could mimic you. It was doing everything they were doing, and then when they uh, turned around to sit down and eat, and they turned around, it was gone. But yeah, I guess they could. Sure, why not? BTO is asking, do you think that Sasquatch are shapeshifters? Possible. My bipedals could be shapeshifters. Shapeshifting goes back a long time, and not only in the werewolf sense, but in a lot of animals. Um, the, uh, the one killer, uh, panther, uh, or tiger, no, it was a tiger over in India. I mean, it was chased many times. They tried to kill it many times after it killed many people in, in different villages and they would be chasing it and it would just disappear. And then they'd go a little further and there'd be a guy walking toward him the other way. And they'd say, did you see the cat? And they'd go like, no, I didn't see nothing. And then they'd walk away and they'd turn around to see him and he was gone. So they finally put it together and said, that's the cat and they kind of considered it a shapeshifter. Uh, Indians, the indigenous, you know, they, they they believed in shapeshifters probably since the dawn of time. Um, shapeshifters can be, you know, uh, when we talked to the indigenous, when we first started investigating the bipedals, and we thought we may have been dealing with uh, skinwalkers, uh, you know, a shapeshifter can be anything it wants to be. It can be a bug, it can be a worm, it can be a snake, it can be a, a bear, it can be a wolf, it can be anything. Or it can be a tree. Or it can be a bird. It can be anything it wants to be. And shapeshifting in history goes back many, many centuries. Um, mermaids, you know, people saw a fish, next thing it was a mermaid. Or they saw this, next thing it was a porpoise. And I just, you know, there's just so many stories of shape-shifting. You know, is it possible? Yeah, why not? Anything's possible. Anything is possible. We don't know. We know a lot, but we don't know everything. And we don't know how things, you know, they're still trying to figure out stuff today that, you know, everybody would have thought we knew by now how to teleport somebody from here to Los Angeles or or um, how to make a hologram call from me to you at your place up in British Columbia. 
I mean, yeah, the stuff is there, and they can they can uh, put it on film, but they can't make it happen. So, anything in my book, anything's possible. I don't I don't put anything out of the realm. Joe is asking, getting back to the mimicking question, have you ever heard of any cases of Bigfoot mimicking animals or human voices? Because he believes he does have a recording of a Bigfoot mimicking cattle down in the valley near him. Uh, there are recordings of what they consider Bigfoot to be mimicking uh, wolves howling, uh, dogs barking, um, uh, wounded animals, uh, squealing, uh, yeah. There's, there's. As a matter of fact, those tapes are on the internet. You can, you can listen to those tapes. There's one that it, it. I swear to God, it's a, it's a woman screaming. And um, no woman in that area, but loud, and and it's, it's, it chills you. It just goes right through you. And different animals make different noises too. I mean, some of the smallest animals in the world. Uh, 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 a groundhog screaming uh, is unbelievable. I mean, <laughs> uh, again, those are those are videos and, and, and stuff you can listen to on the Internet. And somebody told me that one time. He said, listen to this groundhog out in Colorado. Uh, I'm sorry, groundhog. It was a, actually a prairie dog. And he was up on a guy's back porch screaming. You should have heard that. I, it was amazing that that little guy could make all that noise. And very deliberate. Like somebody was really pissed. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I believe that can happen. Yeah. Mm. Let's get to Catherine's question then. Where do you think most of the sightings are happening at this time of the year around the world? Uh, uh, this time of the year, uh, the Northwest. Uh, you know, Oregon, Washington State, uh, Northern California. Um, because you know it's cool. You have rain. You got cool. Um, the desert right now is unbelievably hot, so there I haven't seen any sightings at all down the Four Corners area, you know, like Arizona and that down through there. None, uh, mostly northern uh, Washington State, Oregon, and California, Northern California. As a matter of fact, I haven't even seen any in uh, Canada, in the Northeast. All. That's because we like to keep ours secret. <laughs> Well, if you get a good photograph, send it to me, will you? Well, that's up to Mike Smith, who has his next question for you. He goes, is there any merit to the theory that Bigfoot and Grizzly will not inhabit the same area? Well, th th that's that's come up a lot. Uh, only in the last few years where um, uh, it first came out that Bigfoot and Grizzly were deadly and even mortal enemies. They were always fighting and carrying on. Well, you'd find a body of something, you know. But um, do they have their own territory? Yeah, probably like any other animal out there. I mean, um, although a single barrel wander all over the place, a, uh, a mom and her cubs, they stay close. I mean, they don't wander all over the place. They kind of stay till those those youngins are old enough to get on their own, but um, and Bigfoot could be the same thing. Uh, you know, they they have an area. Um, it, it's they both eat the same type of they both have the same type of diet berries and whatever and and meat. I mean, so fish. Uh, yeah, I, I, I they probably have their own territory. Mm-hmm. I think that would be interesting to see one of those two creatures get together because I think it would be one of those rarities in nature that actually, uh -huh. you know, we would never really see. It's almost like Bigfoot and Dogman getting together as well at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. If there's anything else here for you before we get back to Mothman... Because we did originally decide we were going to talk about Mothman. Oh, Gloria has a question. Yeah, it's in regards to this. She wants you to switch topics and start talking about all these strange humanoid flying creatures in the Chicago area. Okay. So you mentioned a little bit of it in the first 10 minutes of the show. 
Mm-hmm. But are, but are you buying these stories? Are you thinking that people are actually seeing what they are seeing? Well, the last report, uh, which was the, 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 the day before yesterday, and uh, a, a guy and his wife um, who were vacationing in the uh, Chicago area were um, out by the um, observatory along the lake there, Lake Michigan. And it's a very big layout, laid out place. And uh, they saw this um, man bat type thing flying overhead. It was very low, um, very slow. Um, and next thing you know, there was a tour bus that just had 30 people let out of it. And they're all looking at it, pointing at it, yelling and screaming and carrying on. So there are 32 witnesses at one sighting, all describing the exact same thing. Now, fortunately for all the investigators involved, the investigators that are out there right now live there. They work there. I mean, they know the area. And um, uh, the one before that was, it was a month old, but only because the husband didn't want the wife to put it out there. And then she finally convinced him to put it out where they were walking home from dinner. And um, uh, they saw this thing only about 15 feet off the ground above them and it kind of looked like it was going to go away and but it turned on them and came back and um, the glowing yellow eye uh, glowing red eyes of this creature uh just kept you know kept on them and then flew overhead and then went out of sight down the road, down the street and uh um the funny thing is when you look at the map and if anybody wants to see the map and look at the reports there is an interactive map on phantomsandmonsters.com. Uh, just go to interactive maps on the right-hand side. You can pull up the bipedal map of what we're doing here in Pennsylvania with the bipedals, and the old uh, the old reports are also in there. And then you can also pull up all the sightings in the Chicago area of the uh, this phantom bat, whatever it is. It seems to stay along the. Uh, walkway and walkways and bicycle paths of the um, Lake Michigan area there. It is really not all over the place like you would think. It's pretty much in a confined area when you look at the map. It is um, very strange. Uh, This, whatever it is, Uh, the descriptions are all the same. Um, and people say it looks like a man that's a bat. The second or third report, maybe, I think it was, might have been the fourth, a uh, lady walking in the park with her dog. Uh, this thing was standing on the ground. She described it as a man uh, with large wings uh, on his back. And um, as she came up upon him, he turned around and looked at her. She didn't see, see his face at first, but he turned around and looked at her, and then he flew off. Um, it, this is a really bizarre case because, um, you know, Mothman was like a harbinger of things that went bad. Like I said, he was seen at Fukushima, he was seen at this, he was seen at that. I mean, every time something disaster happened, Mothman was seen. Now, fact or fiction? Don't know. But there are a number of people, uh, intuitives and uh, some psychics and some researchers uh, that have a really bad feeling about this, that um, this thing, whatever it is, um, is bad news for something in that area. Um, disaster, fire, who knows, earthquake, I don't know. Uh, but a lot of people think that. And um, if it is a harbinger of, of an issue that's going to happen, um, and being that it has stayed there so long in that one particular area, when you look at the map, you'll see that it's not like it's gone way north, way west, way east. It's staying along the shoreline, and it goes in inland a little bit. But when you look at the map, you're only looking at a few blocks, uh, you know, in. Um, it's not being picked up on radar. And like I said, this area where this thing is seen, is right between the airspace of Midway International and O'Hare International Airport. 
And if you just go back a, a few years ago, you had that hole punched in the cloud by a craft that was seen above O'Hare Airport by a number of people. So what's with that area? I mean, is there is there some disaster looming in the future, or is this just people hallucinating i just find there's just you know when people say about the bipedals or this or anything where there's a lot of creatures seen at one time they always say well it's mass hysteria or or these people are just you know they're one person says in the rest are all me too me too you know the me tooisms but i don't buy that um they're not seen every day uh there is a um a little bit of time space sometime and there was only one time where there were two actually seen um another one that was seen was over a boat and um uh some people out on on the lake uh in a private boat four people and it flew over top of them and so uh, are we dealing with maybe just a large bat but I mean, these people are describing this thing as seven to eight feet tall. And, you know, the largest bat in the world is in Vietnam, a uh, uh, golden, whatever it is, golden fruit bat, I think it's called. And they're they're large, but they're only like three foot tall and a wingspan of about six and a half, seven feet. This thing is much taller with a bigger wingspan. And it's very silent. It doesn't go high. It stays very low. Um, and like I said, it's not picked up on any radar. There's Coast Guard going up and down all the time. They haven't seen it. Um, and the uh, and the researchers out there that are working on this, these investigators, these guys have been around for a long time. I mean, you're not going to fool these guys. They have set up some camera traps because they thought, well, maybe during the daytime it's hiding. There's a series of bridges, and I, when I say bridges, they're not vehicle bridges. They're like walkways. Uh, up this walk that goes along this river walk uh, or lake walk and um, he was up there looking under those and he says you know if someone's going to hide there during the day it was perfect for that because you know it's like a little cooby hole under the bridge that you can just get into and it's all uh, um, like a fence around it so but he said you can get over the fence with a lot you know quick leap and a bound so I really don't know what it is I mean it's not described as Mothman at all. There's no description matching, uh, with the exception of the glowing red eyes. That's it. Uh, the body shape is different. Um, bat-like wings, much taller, uh, more man-like, humanoid-looking. Uh, so it is what it is, I guess. Butch, we only got about five minutes with you, and I got a bunch of questions I want to jam in here. Everett brings up a great point because he lives in the Chicago area. We've seen a lot of guerrilla marketing from horror movies shot in the area. I think of the clown invasion a year ago. Do you think this could be some sort of guerrilla marketing for a new Mothman movie? Oh, it could be, sure. But how are they getting away with it? They're flying this thing in airspace that's restricted. I mean, nobody would give anybody that kind of leeway to fly uh, any type of a drone or a kite or whatever in airspace where you got planes landing every couple minutes. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> and um, uh, the couple investigators out there who are familiar with and know people in the Chicago Police Department said, we catch anybody out here with a drone, they're going to jail. So I don't know. It could be, but I, I, I just, that would be a real stretch. I'm just glad there's no more idiots running around in clown suits because that was getting out of hand totally. Uh, Eric is asking, have there been any recent Mothman sightings in the Chicago area, like within the last week or so? Mm, No. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm aware of, no. All right. And this one goes a little bit more southeast. BTO is asking, is there any new information regarding the Jersey Devil? Um, he's seen occasionally, you know, every now and then. Somebody will come up with it. Well, they'll be in the pine, the Pineys of the, in New Jersey, and they'll come up with seeing the Jersey Devil. But, uh, you know, he's kind of like old school. Um, there haven't been any recent sightings or, or, or um, animal kills like there used to be. So I... 
I, I don't know. I just, if anybody's bringing him up now, it's probably because there's other things going on around the country. Three minutes, my friend. What do we do for three minutes? Seriously. Uh, we have piled the information on to the Spaced Out Radio listeners tonight. you have any conferences coming up that you're attending? Uh, no. Actually, uh, we're getting ready for our expedition season. So um, we'll be heading up to uh, north-central Pennsylvania um, for some weekends up there. Then we'll be heading uh, down toward the middle of the state for some sightings there. And then down to the south of our south central of our state uh for some sightings there that are right on the border of virginia i'm sorry west virginia and pennsylvania uh then we'll be heading northeast up into an area where um a lady and her son going home one night and this was just recent uh has seen something um uh dog-like but very strange as far as its construction. Uh, the head was very large. It had a very large uh, humpback. Um, the legs were all wrong. Like in other words, the back legs looked like the front legs, and the front legs looked like the back legs. And um, very short tail, uh, very nasty looking, and very fast. And um, so we're going to go up and talk to those. But we haven't talked to them in person yet. We've talked to them otherwise, but not in person. And we want to see the area where it happened. And um, and then we will carry on with our expeditions through in through uh, until uh, probably October, mid November, and then we'll we'll cool it for the winter time. Sounds like every, a lot of fun. Everything else is going on. I mean, you know, um, the research continues. Uh, uh, new equipment coming in. Um, we've got a couple new members that we put on. So. A lot how of stuff many, going on. Uh, how many members on your team? You've never really mentioned them. Uh, around the country, uh, 16 investigators and researchers. Uh, I mean, they're all uh, been at it a long, long time. Uh, and uh, overseas, we have one in uh, England and in Poland. You need to get some Canadian content. I'm pretty sure Mike would jump on the bandwagon for that. Oh, I bet he would. Yeah. Yeah, well, I have no... Canada. I mean, I mean, really, we never got anything out of Canada. Um, I think I, I don't think we ever got one report out of Canada. I don't know who they report to up there. I know there's a move on Canada, but I'm sure they're not doing anything. Um, but Canada is such a big place, you know. Uh, but yeah, I'm open to I'm open to investigators in Canada. Yeah, I'm open to investigators anywhere as long as they know what they're doing. They don't get hurt. But uh, everybody that we've got has been at it a long, long time. I mean, you know, 20-plus years, almost all of them. Some are law enforcement. Now, you know, we have all a mix of everything. And um, uh, the two newest ones we just got were Southern California and Virginia. We didn't have anybody in Virginia. We do now. So, um, and we didn't have anybody in Southern California. We had Northern California, but nothing down south, and we just got one there. And um, so we keep busy, um, you know, um, Trying to keep up with Facebook is like a real job. So I know, I, my friend. I try to only hit once or twice a day to clean it up, and then I don't go back on. <laughs> yes, I don't blame you. Hey, tell us all about your website where people can get a hold of you. Uh, they can get us on the website at www.u4cop.com. That's U-F-O-R-C-O-P.com. Uh, they can get me on Facebook under U4COP. They can get me on Facebook under the UFO Research Center of Pennsylvania. They can get me on Facebook under Butch Witkowski. They can get me on Facebook under um, uh, JAR uh, Magazine. So, um, yeah, lots of places to get me. They can IM me if they have a question, or they can send me an email through the website. It comes right to me. Uh, and uh, we'll help anybody out with anything as long as it's serious. You know, Absolutely. if they have a serious question or they they need some information on where to purchase or get equipment or what type of equipment to use or where they should get their mapping from or anything like that i mean you know or anything out of our database they're welcome to and um we'll get right back to them Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much, Butch. You hold on. i got to wrap this thing up because, unfortunately, it is that time. Butch Wachowski's website, once again, uforcop.com. Tomorrow night of the program, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time, Frank Faschino and Stanton Friedman will join us. We're talking the Flatwoods Monster, UFOs, aliens, anything new. We're going to see where it goes. 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time at spacedoutradio.com. I want to say thanks to my team, Everett Themer, Eric Markham from The Encounter Online, Kim Gandy, our Director of Business Management, Thomas McGowan Sales, Bob Davis, our great intro voice, Catherine James, Social Media, Jolene Lammers, Web Design, and our Paracon Coordinator, Lana Scott. Good to have you all part of this team, and I love talking to them, about them, to all of you. And to all you listeners for tuning us in tonight, I greatly appreciate you taking the time. I will be back 21 hours from now. I hope you are too. Remember, do me a favor. Spread the word. Tell a friend. Because together, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, take us home.